Thumbs up. Good evening, everyone. So thankful to have you all with us. We are going to go right into the beginning of our class. So we need to get started. We have a lot to cover, little time as usual. So let's see how we can go forward. Let's start with a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the blessing to have another day of life, health, and strength. We thank you so much for the privilege to come together and to learn of thee. And Lord, we come at this time asking you for grace and wisdom and power so that we may know how to do an efficient work to finish your work in this generation. Abide with us now, Lord. Please forgive us of our sins and send us your Holy Spirit, we pray, for we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 If you have your Laws of Health program, you want to go ahead and take that with you at this present time. And what we're going to do is we're going to look very quickly at the nutrition crisis. Now, one of the reasons we do that, we're going to do this is because yesterday we gave an emphasis on food and we talked about cooking school evangelism. We had time for a cooking class. And now we're going to look at the nutrition crisis. And when we look at the nutrition crisis, you're going to see that this fits in very much with the things that we have been learning. When we typically think of malnutrition, typically when we think of malnutrition, we think of images like this. These are the images that usually come to mind when we're thinking about malnutrition. We're thinking about those who are going through, of course, where the body skeleton can easily be seen, and therefore, that's a clear uh, pictorial of malnutrition. These are individuals who are not getting what the body needs, and therefore the body begins to, quite honestly, eat itself. Okay? Um, this is a process. And then, of course, there's another process here. Who knows the title, what, what this is called? When, we, when an individual's body, and this, what I like about this as far as the image is that an extended belly doesn't always mean that a person is getting nutrition. This is actually a sign of malnutrition. And this is why these are, these, now these are typical pictures that we see uh, on the internet, sometimes infomercials, things of that nature. But then there's another type of malnutrition that we would do well to consider. Another form of malnutrition that's affecting the world even more than the two that we just saw is this image of malnutrition. This is also an image of malnutrition, believe it or not. And this is an image of malnutrition that sometimes people think is cute. Sometimes people think uh, it's okay, innocent, all right. Nevertheless, it's not. And therefore, we must understand that when we see this and when we see that obesity is now officially recognized as a disease, it's not just something where it's just a little cute, a uh, few extra inches, and so on. It is something that we want to consider. Now, remember I referred the book Health Power to you yesterday. Um, it's an excellent book on many levels. It has, it has lots of great things in it. And one of the things that's in it, I believe it's page 168 in the book Health Power, is they have what's called your uh, true weight, where an individual can understand their ideal weight. And typically what they do is, one of the typical things that's done is they'll usually use a tape measure, the same kind of tape measure that you'll see individuals use when they're doing sewing. They'll use a tape measure and they wrap it around the wrist. And depending on the male or the female, there's going to be certain measurements that's going to be used. And of course, it's going to look at low, medium, or high bone density. And based on that, they're able to give you an idea of what your ideal weight should be. There's some other factors in it. When I check mine, my ideal weight is between about 165 and 170. And uh, I'm at currently 168. So I'm right, I'm right where I'm supposed to be from a health standpoint as it relates to ideal weight. You want to look at that if you're underweight or overweight. And you want to do your best to try to make sure that your body is in line with what should be your weight factor. Women, you get more leg room or what we'll call wiggle room. You get more of that space because it also must factor in bearing children. And when women bear children and so on, there's different weight factors that are considered in that context. Nevertheless, it's imperative that you understand what your ideal weight should be so you have a goal. You don't want to say that your ideal weight is what you like because that could be dangerous. That could be very deceptive. Don't forget, your heart's deceitful. My heart's deceitful. So we want to understand our ideal weight from the perspective of physiology, the way God made our bodies, the way they were designed to be structured, and the list goes on. When you understand this, then you can start looking at this and understand, wow, you know, if I'm too big or if my children are too big, you know, some people actually say this is cute. 
There's some people who honestly believe that's cute. They say, oh, look how cute they are. And you know, but nevertheless, obesity amongst children is becoming an epidemic, especially in the U.S. or Western civilized type countries. So what's happening is obesity is affecting the world at large, and it is also a form of malnutrition. And this is why what we want to do is we want to understand food, diet, and what it is that we should be putting in our system versus what it is we should not be doing. And of course, making sure that we are giving our bodies the proper nutrition it needs. You don't want to just eat food for the sake of eating it. You want nutrition. I challenge all of you to do this test. When you get an opportunity, I want you to take a clear glass, a clear glass. And then you're going to take, you're going to have two clear glasses. They can be eight ounce glasses. That's fine. Clear. What I want you to do is I want you to take some carrots. And when you take the carrot, start shredding it and just put the shreds of the carrot in one of the glasses. Once the shred of the carrots get up to about half of the glass, then the next thing I want you to do is take cold water. What kind of water? Cold. Take some cold water and just pour the cold water into that glass with the carrots up to about half a glass. Then I want you to take your hand and put it over the glass. Take your other hand and put it under the glass. And I want you to shake it for 15 minutes just like this. 15 seconds, 15 seconds. Your arms would fall off if you did it for 15 minutes, right? You want to shake it for 15 seconds. And then once you get up to 15, stop. Take the other glass and pour the water. Put your hand over the glass and just pour the water from the carrot glass inside of the other clear glass. Guess what color the water will be? The water is going to be orange. What do you think made that water orange? Yes, the carrot, but what was it in the carrot? The beta carotene is considered to be what? A source of what in the carrot? Nutrition. Nutrition. So in other words, by taking a vegetable in cold water, just a little bit, and just giving it some friction for 15 seconds, it stripped some of the nutrients from that carrot. I wonder then what happens when we take vegetables and instead of putting it in a glass, we put it in a pot. And then when we put it in a pot, we put a lot more than just half a glass of water. And then when we turn the fire on, it's boiling and causing friction amongst those vegetables for much longer than 15 seconds. And then when our vegetables are ready, what is the normal practice? We pick the pot up, we go to the sink, and what do we do? Throw all the water out. And what do you think is mixed in that water? Nutrition. The nutrients are going right down the drain saying, bye. You get that? So therefore, there becomes a more judicious use of even preparing plant-based food. Because our goal is to get the nutrition. We, are, we must break out of the mindset that, well, it wasn't meat, so therefore it's all good. We want nutrition. So the more that we understand that, it's going to even govern how we prepare food. I want to encourage you, in book three of your foods books, there's a section in there just on cookware. Study that. In book three of your foods book, there's a section in there just on cookware. It will talk to you about how the aluminum cookware, it seeps, it leaches. Aluminum can literally leach and it can get into your food. It's one of the reasons why they're finding people are having all these challenges, even brain challenges and so on, because of the aluminum that seeps. Iron skillets. We like to use iron skillets, but quite honestly, the cast iron skillets, they're good. But cast iron skillets are porous. So what that means is that when it gets hot, the pores open. When it gets cold, the pores close. So let's say you are preparing fish in your iron skillet. Then what happens is if you're preparing fish with all of its fish grease and everything else in that iron skillet, then what can happen is when it gets hot, the pores open. But you can't wash that skillet and clean it when it's hot. So what you have to do is you have to wait until the iron skillet does what? 
cool off. But when it cools off, what happens to the pores? They close. So whatever is in the pores also closes inside the pores. So then when tomorrow, when you want to use your iron skillet again and you warm it up, then the pores are going to open and whatever was in it is going to come out of it and mix with your food. So now we have to become a bit more intelligent. That's why typically it has been found that stainless steel is one of the best forms of cookware for individuals to use. And it's pretty cost effective. Teflon, we always use that for our pancakes. But Teflon has a tendency to chip and to break. And it can get into your food. So you'll find that these are all these things we have to consider when we're eating. We eat for nutrition. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 10, 17, eat for strength, not for drunkenness. Another way of saying that is eat to get nutrition, not just for the pleasing of our taste buds only. Use good cookware that's conducive to making sure you, your nutrition is maintained without the additives. You follow that? Cookware? Yeah. Absolutely. The glassware is good. is pretty good as well. But why is it always so kind of messed up and it seems to change when you buy it? I mean, it depends. Pe sometimes people are more concerned about saving money than about providing health. So therefore, they come out with several other products. So here it is that we're talking about nutrition. Now, that means that we want to get people off of the SAD items. Remember we talked about SAD? Uh -huh. What does SAD stand for? Standard American diet. So this is a pictorial of the standard American diet. All sorts of rich pastries, of course, your various meat options, some of your alcohol, your cheeses and everything, rich, rich pastries and gravies. This is a picture of sad items. We want to go from sad and, of course, we want to go to glad. Remember glad, talking about God's life-activating diet, the things that we can eat. That's a kale sandwich. Yeah. So you see that? So you can go to, you know, the raw foods, and there are different types of wonderful options. We saw some of that today at a restaurant we went by. And, and the goal is to go to food. Now, one thing I can assure you is that this will not only taste good, this is loaded with nutrition. You get that? So therefore, we want to go from sad to glad, and when you eat glad, that's when we know we're eating in the, the context of eating to the glory of God. Whatsoever you eat, whatsoever you drink, whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. All right? So this is the goal that we're seeking for, eating for strength, nutrition. Now, understanding that, that means, of course, we're going to choose more plant foods. We'll understand also that the Cancer Society recommends uh, that we eat more plant foods. So even the Cancer Society is realizing this. This is not a mystery by a long shot. Many scientific studies show that eating fruits and vegetables protect against cancer, among several other wicked and horrible diseases. And then, of course, they found that a plant-based diet is indeed the superior diet because it's the one that God said was beneficial for man in Genesis 129. Now, with that being understood, we are going to move to meal planning meal planning. Now, in your meal planning, you're going to find that in your Laws of Health document, if you go back just a couple of pages, after you go through the Laws of Health program, you'll see that there's meal planning on your last page. All right? Meal planning on your last page. This is a sample. This is a sample of what you and I can use. Now, you'll see, uh, you know, these letters like EF. If you see EF, that just stands for Encyclopedia of Foods. Okay? Encyclopedia of Foods, which you have. Okay? And that just helps us to understand certain things that we're looking at. Yes, my sister. But what you look at, you said over the page called She Left I was showing you that. Okay, you didn't, you, le you probably left early yesterday. We, um, yeah, my husband had to no problem. We, this is a document for you. Let me, pass this back, please. Don't worry, don't you have to come up, sis. All right. Okay, two more. Okay. All right. Pass these back for me, please. Pass this all the way to the back. We have two gentlemen in the back who need those. Yes. All right. Now, there were some other documents. So if you left yesterday and you didn't get the documents that were given out at the end of class, we have them here for you. Now, on that last page, did you need one as well? Sure, no problem. No problem at all. All right. 
When we look at meal planning, you can look at it on the back, but I also put it up here on the screen, okay? When we look at meal planning, we want to go ahead. These are suggestions. This is not law, but these are suggestions. And you're going to find that these suggestions are helpful. By the way, I would say to a degree it is law, only because you'll find that these suggestions are coming from counsel. Okay? Now, first thing is, eat together. Amen. <coughs> Amen. Amen? I want to encourage you, do your absolute best. Give diligence to eat together. If you are a family... If you are single or by yourself, then we understand. But if you are a family, try to eat together. It's a blessing when family can sit down and break bread together. And that's a great time to talk to each other. Husband talking to wife, wife to husband, children to parents, parents to children, brothers to sisters. It's a beautiful time for communion. And therefore, eat together. That's one of the first things we're going to talk about in meal planning. Start being deliberate to eat together. One of the greatest things that the fast food industry has done is break up families. Because now, individuals no longer felt a sense of urgency to eat at home with the family because now they can go ahead and just pick up something from the Golden Arches off of the, off of the highway. So therefore, you found that people were more apt to just go into the restaurant and getting a quick hit so they can continue working rather than making it a priority to come home and sit together and eat together. So I want to really encourage you, eat together. That's going to be the first thing I'm going to recommend in meal planning, if it is possible. We know that there are some working schedules where it's just impossible at the present time, at least, for husband and wife and so on to eat together. But as much as possible, eat together. It's a beautiful time for communion one with another. Amen? Amen. All right. Now, in addition to that, we're going to look at some of these things. Now, these are the principles and suggestions that are on your document, but I'm just putting them up here on the screen as well. Meals should be eaten on a regular daily schedule. You remember yesterday when we were giving uh, the regimen for individuals who were suffering with disease, and you mentioned how regularity in their eating was very important. Praise God for that. And so you'll find that you want to, make your, you want to do your best, that if you have breakfast at 8 o'clock, try to have it at 8 o'clock every day. If you have dinner at 3 o'clock, try to have it at 3 o'clock every day. You want to do your absolute best to have regularity. The body loves regularity. The body is made up of rhythmic system and order. And so it is that when we eat in a rhythmic pattern, when it's regular, it ministers to the body. And therefore, try to have a regular daily schedule. Two, meals should be spaced how much? Five to six hours apart. So once you finish a meal, if you finish your meal at 8.30, nothing goes in your mouth any earlier than 1.30. That is something that, that requires digestion. Nothing goes, nothing. How many things? Nothing. nothing goes in your mouth that requires digestion. Water does not require digestion. Nothing goes in your mouth that requires digestion between 8.30 and 1.30. You get that? That's very, very important, brothers and sisters, because if you do that, you're going to cause indigestion in your system. This is how it starts to grow into serious complications that literally can birth into things like ulcers and tumors and all these really bad things that we see happening to a lot of precious people. It starts from simple little bad habits like that. So no eating between meals, okay? Yes. But if you are doing fruit, like fasting, that could be... I was just going to say that. The only time you will do under the five or six hours is if you're doing just total raw. If you're doing something where it's just your fruits, and I can't even say total raw because nuts could be included in that raw. So it's really fruit. That's right. Fruit, because nuts alone takes approximately three hours to digest. Nuts alone. Fruits are typically about two. So that's why you want to just have fruit. If you're doing fruit, then you go ahead and you do your fruit. That's going to take about two hours, and then you can go ahead and have another meal thereafter. But when it comes to a full meal where you have your complex carbohydrates, you have your vitamins, you have your proteins, and the list goes on. When you have a full, well-balanced meal, a minimum of five hours. Minimum. And there are times that you may even find yourself benefiting by six. If you're still feeling that fullness and satisfaction of the system, then you may say, well, let me wait until hour number six. And then I'm going to go ahead and have that next meal. All right? Yes. True. Dried, dry. That is true. There are dry, dried fruits can take a bit longer. I'm not sure about the three specifically, but nevertheless, I have heard some things along those lines where your dried fruit can take a little longer for digestion in comparison to your fresh fruit. All right? 
Absolutely. Thank you for that. Talking about like in the evening time when someone wants to eat fruit. Well, let's build on to the evening time. Five to six hours apart with a how much? Four to five hours space between the last meal and bedtime. So therefore, if your, la if your bedtime is 10 o'clock, and I'm telling you the truth. Now, some of these things, they come from books like Health, Power, and so on, but I'm going to make a recommendation. Make it five, please, and not four. If you are going to bed at 10 o'clock, you should be finished with your meal by 5 o'clock. Not starting your meal at 5 o'clock. Finished your meal at 5 o'clock. You get that? So if you're going to bed at 10, you want to be finished with your meal by 5. So that way you know you're going to bed on an empty stomach. The goal is to go to bed on an empty stomach. You don't want your body working while the body should be resting and rebuilding. Okay? So therefore, that is the, con the, 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 the last meal of the day. You want to make sure four to five or five hours space between the last meal and bedtime. Drink your water two hours after a meal or 15 to 30 minutes before the meal. Not with the meal, not even water. Sometimes people say, well, what about water? No, you do not drink your water with your meal. That can cause indigestion. You do not want to have it with the meal. My wife is Haitian. And in the Haitian culture, many West Indian cultures, what they call soup is better known to Americans as porridge. And you'll find that their, their, their porridge is so thick, you, you can't even use a straw to eat it. It's thick. You have to use a spoon and scoop it. It's like a meal in and of itself. When we eat soup, now, different in Asian culture especially, soups are very, very, a very large part of Asian culture for the most part. And their soups are typically very watery. Lots of liquid and then some solid in between. That's bad. It's actually bad from a digestion standpoint. That's, that's, that's solids and liquids coming together. So that, that's not the goal. You do not want to do solids and liquids coming together like that because the digestive juices, the gastric juices, are always going to absorb liquids before solids. And because it's going to absorb the liquids before the solids, it's usually not going to be able to break down all the solid once it's finished with the liquid appropriately, and it's going to cause a longer digestion process upon which some of that food can begin to putrefy. Fancy word for rot. Fancy word to break down and ferment. And as it begins to ferment, it releases toxins. And those toxins can be manifested in all sorts of ways from pimples to weak hair, uh, br brittle nails, and the list goes on. Tumor growth, growths of several kinds. That's why you do not want to do soups or cereals. When you do your cereals, you want, not that you're not going to do it. Hear what I'm saying. What you're going to do with your cereals, cold cereals, is what you can do is pour a little bit of milk and get it just to the point that it gets an, a soggy enough that you can go ahead and enjoy it. But what happens is this thing where we normally drown it, it's over. Bid thee farewell. Go ahead, everybody do this. You get that? So that, that's what has to happen now, okay? Seriously, because we're talking about good digestion. So you do not want to just drown your cereal in all that milk and then, because you know what you do, when you take a big spoonful of cereal, you take it in and what's the first thing you do? swallow all the milk. Right. So you're taking a big gulp of the milk, and then you're chewing your food, and then you take down the solid. And when you do that over and over and over again, you are literally having a good amount of liquid in your system now, along with that solid, and your gastric juices are like, okay, I got to take down this liquid first. And it's going to go ahead and work on that liquid, and then what remains can go ahead and work on the solid, and that's why the solid typically remains behind and it starts to go through that fermentation process. Gastritis and all these other issues start popping up. So this is why... Even if you don't eat in between meals and stop the digestion and start it, that's still... Yeah, if, you, if, you're putting liquid and, if you're putting liquids and solids together, you've already created indigestion. You're already on the path. That's the point. Milk is with calories, but it, it, it's, it's too much of a liquid. The constitution of the product itself cannot be broken down on equal par with the solids. It's kind of like eating broccoli and watermelon. They're both going to break down differently. You get that? Even though they're both, you know, from the plant kingdom, generally speaking. That's why the general rule, fruits and vegetables separated. Did you hear what I said, general? Because we can start getting sticky with this, can't we? Hey, an avocado's a fruit. 
tomatoes are fruit, da 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 But you know, and, and some of the ways that individuals have studied this is they basically say acid alkaline. You know, you have your alkaline type products and then you have your acid type products. And uh, some of the ways that they define what's the kind of fruits and vegetables that can go together. If it's alkaline fruit, then it can go with the vegetables. But if it's acidic fruit, then you don't. So this is some of the things, but I still believe personally that this is still debatable in the medical world. So I just give more of a general. Like I, and I use the example that I did as an obvious. Broccoli and watermelon. No one will argue they break down at different time frames. Right? Because you can, you can almost suck watermelon. You can just shake a bite and just shh, and it's, you know, it's gone because there's so much water. You, you try doing that with a broccoli. You get that? So, you know, different, different substance. So general rule, fruits and vegetables separate. Again, liquids and solids, keep them separate. Half an hour before, 15 to 30 before, two hours after. You, you need okay? A good thing to mention, too, is no spicy food. Because if you have spicy, then you've got to drink. We, well, we, are, we, we did cover that, but we're going to go over that, too. We can go over that. Because Sister Althea was talking about be mindful of the spicy food. But that includes salt. Salt's not spicy, but it'll create thirst. So that's why you want to watch out for your sodium. Now, I'll let you in on a little secret about how you can alleviate yourself from the thirst issue. But go ahead, Sister Kayla. I was just going to say, because I love that toast with a soup. So you could drink your broth part of your soup half hour before and then finish your vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> <Half hour later. laughs> Sounds good. Out, right? Sounds good. Go, you can experiment with it. Hey, be creative. Some people can make, by the way, broth by itself is a great third meal. So sometimes you could take the broth and say, I'll reserve this as my third. The nutritious part. You know? Nice. Of course. So you got different options. Yeah. So let's go on. Be creative. Be creative. Meals should be eaten in order of digestion. Meals should be eaten in order of digestion. One of the things that take longest to digest are nuts. And that's why many a times you will find that individuals will have nuts as the last part of their meal. Some of the, me some of the things that we eat that cr get really promotes good enzyme activity are your fruits and vegetables. And that's why typically when someone eats a full meal, plant-based, they start with their fruit, if we're talking breakfast. You start with your fruit. Then you go to your complex carbohydrate, your pancakes, your biscuits, or your oatmeal, or your quinoa, or your millet, or whatever it is you're using. And then you can go ahead and go to a protein if you're going to have it. The protein might be something like your tofu, or whatever the case may be, if you, make, uh, if you make one of your veggie meats or something, if you choose to do that. And then finally, you'll do your nuts or your seeds. So therefore, you do your nuts or your seeds, and that's usually the last complementary part of your meal. So there's a way that individuals do this. And remember, digestion begins in the mouth, so chew your food. Don't be so American. Americans rush to get things done. We, as a, we, I say we, we as Americans, we love to rush to get things done quick, quick, quick. That's America today. And what happens is we eat like that. Some of us will take food in our mouths, chew, chew, swallow, chew, chew, swallow. And then we just go ahead and, and we're taking big gulps of the food. Take your time. Slow down. Chew your food. Your food should feel almost similar to like how oatmeal would feel in your mouth before you swallow. So you're saying eat your fruit, like your strawberries, and then eat your pancakes, don't put those strawberries on top of the pancakes? Some people will do that with their pancakes, but it's just good to go ahead. There are some studies that have shown that eating your fruit first, in the first action of the meal, produces certain enzymes that prepares the body better for digestion of everything else that comes after. Correct. So therefore, you want to go ahead and start putting those fruit in. Now, do me a favor, write down your questions. I don't, I don't want to get lost in this, okay? Breakfast time. You can write down your breakfast time if you need that kind of help, where you say, I'm going to have breakfast at this time to this time every day. That's for you, and you see that on your paper. So if you need to do that, some people need to do that. I see people who remind themselves of what they need to do every day. Hey, know where you're at, know your weaknesses, know what you need to get done. Nothing wrong with that. So therefore, set your times to go ahead and eat your meals. Then example of meal structures. The example of meal structures are very simple. If you're going to have breakfast, the first thing you want to keep in mind is three to five servings of fruit per day. A large apple is equivalent to two servings. A large banana is equivalent to two servings. A large mango is equivalent to two servings. So if I had a large apple, a large banana, and a handful of grapes, that's five servings of fruit. You get that? So don't get intimidated by seeing those numbers. Because sometimes we say, five servings of fruit? And you know, we think like we're, 
we got a big basket of fruit that we have to eat. But no, that's not true. Now, if you're eating those little small, tiny apples, I don't, crab apples and stuff like that, you know, that, that's going to be equivalent to basically one serving. So if you did like that, if you ate like that, then yeah, you'd need to eat five crab apples, you know, if you're eating those little things. But once you start to get into your larger fruits, then yeah, it's going to basically be equivalent to about two servings. So if you had two large fruits and then a handful of grapes or something else, you had your five servings, you're good for the day. Always include berries as much as possible. There's so much diversity in them. Why? Antioxidants. You want those antioxidants. Anything that ends in berry, blueberry, raspberry, blackberry, berries, boys and I mean, berries. So you have lots of options. So if you don't like one, you can work with another. You get that? So therefore, keep that in mind. But have that daily, folks. This is your day-to-day -day mechanism of health. This is the prevention, okay, as well as your cure if you're sick. Then you can have your cooked whole grain. Always remember the two words, whole grain. Do not get enriched. Enriched is a very scary word, and it's a deceptive word. I'm going to tell you the truth. When I saw enriched wheat bread, I said, man, this is super wheat bread. Cause that's what I thought. Rich. Rich means lots. So I'm thinking, this is super wheat bread. But then one day I did some research. In your same book, Health Power, and it's also in the foods book when you start studying grains, it'll show you that an average grain, it actually comes with approximately 24 vitamins within one grain. Now what they did in the processing of grains, commercial processing, is they stripped all 24. Watch this. They put back four and called it enriched. What they did was they took the whole grain, the different parts of the grain, the endosperm and all these different parts of the grain, and that makes up a whole grain. Well, what the commercial milling processing did is they actually stripped all the 24 vitamins from the grain, and then they only put four back and they call it enriched. Why do they do that? It's good for money. It's good, it's good for mass production. Yeah, what kind of vegetables? I mean, grains. Wheat. It could be wheat. It can be oats. This is, this is why when you go to the store and you get certain cereals, you can read the back of it. It'll tell you right there, enriched wheat bread. Enriched such and such. It's going to tell you right there. We have, we have the New Ages to say thank you for that. They were the ones who fought really hard to have accurate labeling on the back of food so that we can know what we're eating. So therefore, they, 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 they made the beef, and now today, we can find out what we're eating and what we're putting in our system. Well, you want to do whole grains. Now, your whole grains can still be pancakes. We have pancakes at our home. They can still be biscuits. You can still enjoy oatmeal. You can enjoy millet. My wife was going to make a millet pudding yesterday for you all. I mean, millet is just phenomenal. So you can enjoy quinoa. You can make all sorts of things. We have a brother who, who's a cookbook we, we often share with others. His name is uh, Calvin Jared. Calvin's last name. Howell, right? Yes. Calvin Howell. He is the chef who works at Meat Ministry, which is that organization I told you about. It was interesting. Every day that we ate at Meat Ministry, we noticed they never served the same thing twice. Mm -hmm. One day, it might have been oatmeal. The next day, it might be rye. The next day, brown rice. They actually served that with breakfast. Brown rice, they put a little coconut milk on it, and then they put some berries on there. That thing tasted phenomenal. I mean, you would have never thought brown rice for breakfast? That's a dinner food. Mm -hmm. But no, no, no. So in other words, you can go, there's so many grains that God has given to us. I challenge any of you, look in your book ones when you get time, and you look up grains. Did you know corn is a grain? It's not a vegetable? Yeah. Did you know that I found that out late? Mm -hmm. I was as ignorant as anybody. I mean, I honestly thought that corn was a vegetable. My mother used to say, eat your vegetable. I was like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and I'd eat plenty of corn. Because I love the way it tastes. <laughs> but here it is, corn is a grain. So, I mean, you, you have lots and lots of grains that you can work with. But the goal is make sure they're whole grains so you get the full benefit of what God gave. And this is how we're finding that individuals who want to lose weight, this is why in the cover of Health Power, it says eat more, weigh less. And the reason why is because if you're eating the right foods, this thing that some of these people are doing today to starve themselves to lose weight, it's really not necessary. 
<laughs> it's really not, it's not, it's not necessary, you don't have, unless you like punishment. You know, if you like punishment, work with it. If it does something for your psyche, but really and truly, you don't have to punish yourself. You can eat. You can still eat food. And at the end of the day, you can still lose weight at the same time. You just got to eat the right foods, then right portions, and the list goes on. So therefore, five servings of fruit. Your whole grains, quarter plate. Quarter plate of whole grains. That's a good amount. And that, so that principle is going to go for your second meal. You can use a nut milk. You have all sorts of options of milk, so you don't have to use animal milk. So you can use cashew milk. Cashew milk tastes phenomenal. And then there's almond milk. And then, of course, there's coconut milk. And then there's soy milk. And I highly recommend, brothers and sisters, diversify even your milks. Try not to just do soy every day. Do soy sometimes, do rice. Then go ahead and do coconut. Then go ahead and do cashew. Then go ahead and do almond. Switch it up. Switch it up so your body can get a more balanced, well-rounded amount of nutrients coming in its system. Seeds. Gentlemen, what's the best seed you can eat if you want to go ahead and keep that prostate working well? Who said it? Pumpkin. Very good, Mom. Pumpkin. Pumpkin seed. You can use pumpkin. Can you use sesame seed? Sure you can. Can you use sunflower seed? Absolutely. So you can use different seeds. And you can, again, allow it to be foods that can minister to the body. But have some seeds in there. Highly recommended. Highly recommended. Pumpkin seeds eaten whole or ground and so on. Freshly grounded flax seed. What is flax seed going to give you? Omega-3. Omega-3. So who needs fish oil? Amen. You get that? So we don't need fish oil. You can get, you can get your omega-3s from your flax seed or you can get it from your walnuts. You can get it from lecithin. Soy, lec soy lecithin. Some people put lecithin in. Lecithin is really good for promoting good circulation in the body. So you can use all sorts of different things to go ahead and make sure you're getting a nice, well-balanced diet and getting a good breakfast. All right? Handful of nuts. Do not get greedy and overstretch your hands. Just go ahead and just natural relaxation, grab a handful of nuts, and that's a good amount of nuts to eat. What are the nuts you can eat? You can eat, well... I was going to say almonds, but you went and messed with me now. So what some call almonds. But then you can go ahead and get cashews. You can still get walnuts. You still have lots of beautiful options in the nut kingdom that can work on your behalf. Macadamia nuts. I mean, lots of really nice nuts. Hazelnuts. Great nuts. Yes, pecan, pecans are wonderful. I love pecans. So say again. Chia. Well, the chia is seeds. So you, you put that under seeds, chia seeds. But again, very nutritious. Very nutritious. Chia seeds are good. What do you do if you're allergic to nuts? Then how can you do if you have an allergic reaction to nuts, go ahead and try your seeds. See how your body responds to different seeds. The same way the nut kingdom is very diverse, so it is with the seeds. So try some seeds and see if that works better with your system. Try some nuts. Go through some cleansing, detoxing, and then come back to it. I have one friend who was uh, the thing where you can't eat any weed or anything like that. Celiac. celiac thank you. She was celiac. And uh, she was like that for a long time. But here it is. She started faithfully practicing the laws of health. She started to, of course, lift her situation up to God. Today, she is no longer celiac. Today, she can eat wheat. No reactions. None. Zero. So therefore, what you are today does not guarantee that you'll be that tomorrow. Maybe there's just a need for greater faithfulness. Sometimes people go through hysterectomies. You know what a hysterectomy is, right? When you lose your uterus and everything. Fibroids can cause that. Fibroids. Those tumorous growths that can grow within the midsection of the system. Our, our dear sisters suffer with this. And uh, you'll find that sometimes people go through, what, and what's the thing that we fear most when you don't have your uterus and, you're, and, you're, and you, yeah, you're scared about menopause, right? But I know several, there are some sisters that we know who are faithful to the laws of health. And as a result of that, they are well over their 50s. Never gone through menopause. Because menopause is always connected back to hormones, right? So therefore, you'll find that faithful adherence to the laws of health may get the hormone balances to such a level. There may be a need to use certain um, herbal, herbal uh, remedies as well. And you do that along with the faithful practice of the laws of health. And today, the individual who goes through the hot flashes and all those things, by God's grace, they don't have to go through it later. So you'd be amazed at what God can do with our precious bodies as long as we cooperate with him. So that's slide number one, just as an example for breakfast. Now we go ahead and go to number two, dinner time. 
Do the same thing. Go ahead and set up your times. You set up the times from what p.m. to what p.m. And you go ahead and set up your dinner times. And as you set up your dinner times, raw vegetables are first. You want to have a raw salad. When you have that raw salad, as it has been mentioned, when you all were helping diagnose, the, uh, well, not diagnose, but putting together a program for individuals suffering with disease, you want to make sure that your raw vegetables are inclusive of nice, dark, green, leafy vegetables. We want to try to remove the um, iceberg as much as possible because the nutrition levels are very low with that. So go ahead and get into your romaine and your green leaf, your red leaf, and so on. Um, you can certainly add things to it. Add some shredded carrot. Maybe add some olives or avocado or otherwise. Beautiful things that help to build up and enhance the nutrition nutrition levels. Excellent. Make your salad dressings. We tried that yesterday. How did you like your salad dressings? Praise the Lord. So, and those are just exa two examples among several of salad dressings that you can enjoy. And you make it yourself, it's all good, no sin in your dish. Isn't that nice? Some people use it as a sauce over their food. Enjoy. Of course, we always remember. Judiciously use that which is good. All right? Whole grains, your potatoes, whole grain pastas, breads, brown rice, and the list goes on. So you, can, you have several things that you can use as far as your whole grain for your second meal. And these, again, you can do them basically about a quarter of the plate. And this is excellent because you're having your raw food, you're having your cooked whole grains, which is fine. You don't have to go total raw, even though we should do a great portion of raw. You want to make sure, by the way, that your salad, try to make it at least half a plate's worth, because then that way you know you're getting a good, sufficient amount. If you're giving yourself a measurement, some people use two strips of lettuce talking about they had their salad. So you <laughs> half a plate full, all right? And don't stretch the lettuce over your plate talking about, <laughs> you know, I mean, don't be slick. You know, you get the point, don't you? All right. How big a plate? You know, I'm going to use the example of dinner size plate. The, in, in, the, in the world of, oh, what's the word they use for these things? In the world of plates and cups and forks, they have something, dinnerware, okay. They have a plate that's referred to as a dinner plate. So I'm going to use, yeah, it's, it's, the, it's the larger plate. So yeah, we're going to use the example of a dinner plate. We're going to use that as our measurement tool for lack of inches and so on, because I, I, I unfortunately don't have that. Then you can have cooked vegetables or steamed vegetables, I would prefer to say. And that can be your green, your yellow, your orange, and your red or purple, because all those colors just talk about different vitamins and nutrients that you can add in your system. That can be your broccoli. That can be your squash. That can be your, um, you know, you name it, asparagus. That can be your cabbage. That can be your eggplant, and the list goes on. So you have a lot of things. Of course, eggplant is more of a fruit than vegetable based on the seed concept. Then... We want to go ahead and go on to, um, you know, well, let me I see called, here. When I called Porter, they tried to do this too, but because it was your biggest meal was breakfast, they served us dinner for breakfast. I mean, the, the meat, yeah. the, the vegetables, everything. And then we had peanut butter and banana honey sandwiches for dinner. <laughs> well, I mean, they started good, but they finished kind of bad. But um, understood, you know. There are a lot of people who do what we would call break dinner meals for breakfast. I went to a West Indian restaurant, and I said, do you guys serve breakfast? And they said, yes. And I said, all right, what do you have? And they started giving me all this dinner food. And I was like, what's wrong with you? I said, breakfast. And, you know, in their mind, they're saying, this is what we eat for breakfast. So you'll find that, you know, there are different concepts of what even constitutes a breakfast. You know, again, there's the quote-unquote American way, you know, the, the sweet things for the breakfast and then the more non-sweet things for the dinner. That's the typical American culture. Nevertheless, there are lots of people who do a switch. Um, I wouldn't go as far as saying mandatory, but nevertheless, there are individuals who have had more dinner type meals for their breakfast and then they'll go have a more of a quote-unquote breakfast type meal for their second meal of the day. And there's lots of people who do that. That may be very practical, especially for certain working situations because they're, sometimes breakfast meal type dishes are easier to make. So therefore, they'll let that be the second meal of the day because that's the one where they're at the job probably having to prepare it. But when they're home is in the morning. So therefore, they do more of their laborious food preparation in the morning with the dinner meal. So some people do that. So therefore, it's fine. You look at your dynamics, you look at your circumstances. 
Nut loaves, these are where you can get a lot of your proteins from. You had an example of a nut loaf yesterday. Of course, your beans. Anytime you combine rice and beans together, that makes a complete protein. Okay? So you don't have to say, well, my protein only comes from eating a veggie meat or something like that. There's lots of things that have protein. And that's why if you look in your foods book, book one, remember on the back, there's a whole section right there on protein. And you have lots of different options of where you can get your proteins from. Then, a dessert. Now, desserts are optional. I mean, desserts are certainly not mandatory. And uh, with your desserts, just remember, it, your desserts can contain nuts, so nut butters are ideal. But, you know, again, you want to watch out with the fruit because if you're having a lot of vegetables, then you want to be careful about adding fruit into there only because it could create some adverse responses in your system. <coughs> so you want to be careful with that. But nevertheless, desserts are okay. Yesterday you had an example of a tofu pie, you know, or something like that. Um, you know, these are different types of options, lots of options. Um, we have a good friend of ours who's, who bakes, and I mean, she can make cakes and cookies and so many things. My wife making cakes, cookies, and so many things. There are really lots of options. But remember, always remember, Proverbs 24, 13. Eat that which is good, but only eat so much as is sufficient for thee, lest thou be filled therewith and vomited. Brother Chin Lee, you don't have to write these down. It's right here for you. Pass this back, please. Um, everyone has a copy of that, okay? And on the last page, you have all these things right here, brother. So here it is. You're welcome. So here's all these different things that the Lord has given to us as far as ideas of good regularity. These are examples that we can use that are very, very helpful. And then finally, your third meal. Your third meal of the day, again, the goal is to, if you're going to have a third meal, then your first and second meal needs to be a lot earlier. As an example, if you're eating, let's say you take half an hour to eat your food. So then you go ahead and eat at 8 o'clock. So you finish at 8.30. So next time to eat is at what time? What time is that? 1.30. Five hours. Okay. If you finish at 8.30, 9.30, 10.30, 11.30, 12.30, 1.30. So you have five hours. So 1.30, you go ahead and eat again. And let's say you finish by 2 o'clock because it takes half an hour for you to eat, as an example. So then now we're at 7 o'clock. But let's say your bedtime is 10 o'clock. This is where a light supper can fit in. Now, there are several things people can do for a light supper. Broth, but broth by itself. No noodles. No, keep them noodles out of there. No noodles. It's broth, broth by itself. That's okay. That can be digested in enough time for you to still go to bed on an empty stomach. Fruit, that can still be digested in enough time where you can go to bed on an empty stomach. But don't overindulge in fruit. You know, I mean, if you got a large apple that can equal those two servings, you might just have that large apple, you know, or what have you. Once you start doing chips, tortillas, and things of that nature, what's going to happen is because there's oils mixed in it, it'll take longer for it to digest. So that's what you watch out for. You get that? Write it down for you if you don't mind, brother. Juicing, it depends on what's in your juice, because you can juice and put grains in there. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying, so you can't use juicing generally. If you're just basically taking some, uh, some berries, some bananas, and so on, but again, you're not putting all these proteins and all these other additives in there, nuts. If it's just fruit, you can go ahead and have it. Or if it's a vegetable. Yes, that's fine, as long as it's raw. Don't, don't start including. Once you put, like, I would say salad, but the problem with salad is what you're going to put on the salad. What's mixed in the dressing? Oil. Nuts. So therefore, it can take longer. That's why generally salads would not be recommended as the third meal. It's going to take longer to digest. Fruit, you don't have to put as much additives, even though there's a whipped cream you could make. Man, y'all missed out on that whipped cream. But there's, there's good things you can make. You get that? Also, if you don't want to eat, especially if you're weight conscious, but you're hungry. It's 7 o'clock, you're saying, I don't want to eat, but I'm hungry. Guess what you can drink? Water, Water with fresh lemon juice. Lemon juice has the ability to curb appetite cravings. So if you drink lemon water, you will find that it will help curb the cravings for the appetite. And you'll be able to be all right, and then you go to bed at 9 or 10 o'clock, and then you wake up in the morning ready to have a great big breakfast. All right? So when we think about the light supper, generally we want to keep in mind that two meals a day instead of three is better. 
Keep that in mind. Two meals a day is highly recommended. Um, it gives rest to the digestive organs, and the list goes on. It's best. It is recommended. You read that in councils on diets and foods. And again, if the third meal is taken, fruit, fruit smoothie, juice, broth, juice. That's when juice is appropriate. People say, when can I drink juice? You could drink juice either after the fifth hour. In other words, you finish breakfast at 8.30. It's now 1.30. You want to go ahead and have some juice before you go ahead and have your 2 o'clock meal. That's okay. But when we try to go ahead and drink the juice in between, juice requires digestion as well. So therefore, it wouldn't be the best to do that. So juice, broth, fruit, smoothie, fruit, all of these can be considered a meal by itself. By itself. The only thing I'll say with juice is be mindful of the calories. Calories. Some of these juices, you depend on where you get it from and what you're drinking, they're pretty high in calories. And then also, as mentioned, sugar. Be mindful of that. Herbal therapy, if herbal therapy is needed, herbal teas are fine. Herbal teas are fine. Be careful with green tea. Green tea has caffeine in it. So, you know, yeah, so watch out when you, you know, you hear green tea and because a lot of the herbal health world it takes a lot of these things, sometimes we say, well, let's go ahead and let's do it too. But you don't, you don't need to do that, all right? So these are examples of things that we can do for meal planning structures. You got that? All right, good. Now what we're going to do is we're going to move on into our next phase. Our next phase we're going to get into if there is a type of evangelism that the Lord has opened a door for us in, it is being able to get into environments that normally would have been prohibited for Seventh-day Adventists to get into. And I want you to notice this. What is the ultimate goal of what we're trying to do with people? What are we trying to share with them? We're trying to share the gospel. And we're trying to share the gospel as revealed through the? Beautiful. Now, now you sound like you're getting it to me. I love that. So now, that's right. We're trying to share the gospel with the individuals as revealed through the three angels' messages. Praise the Lord. And we want to help warn them, especially of the message of the? Third angel, because that's the one that's shown us that time is almost finished. This Mark of the Beast issue is coming around the corner. This Sunday law crisis, right? Yes. Now, I want you to look at another dynamic. Remember we talked about how the gospel is not limited to lip service, but it's also an experience? Remember we studied that? Okay, can I show you another experience of the third angel? Go to Revelation 14. I want you to look at this. Revelation 14, we're going to consider verse 12. Now, in Revelation 14 and verse 12, I want you to see something that's very, very important for our, for our observation. In Revelation 14 and verse 12, let's notice what the Bible says. The summarization of those who are experiencing the three angels' messages is found in Revelation 14, 12. Notice what it says. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that what? And have the faith, the faith of Jesus Christ. Now, understanding this, that means that the experience of those who are walking in the light of the third angel's message is that we must keep God's commandments, yes? And we certainly must have the faith of Jesus, right? Okay, but notice how the Bible describes them because what we want to do is I want you to test your own heart right now and take a look at this. The saints keep the commandments of God and also have the faith of Jesus, amen? So you know that that needs to be what? That needs to be my experience, right? Because the gospel is something we experience. We don't just talk about it, right? Okay. Now, what I want you to consider is this. If we are going to keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, that means we need to be what kind of saints? Patient. How are you doing? How are you doing? How's it going? Is it going all right? Are you doing well? The only people that are going to keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, they must also understand what it is to be patient. So whoever makes up this group, they are patient people. Is that right? That means they can't get irritated so easily. They can't get mad when, just, when sometimes we don't see eye to eye with each other. Or maybe we don't see things in the same manner with one another. We can't get mad and irritated and lose our cool. patience or cool in the common vernacular. I thought we were patiently 
waiting for Christ. That's what that says. No. <laughs> no. Here is the patience. The word patience means long suffering. They know how to suffer long. That's what the word patience means in the Greek. Long suffering. That's a fruit of the spirit, is it not, Brother Chen Lee? It's a fruit of the spirit. Long suffering. Now think about this. If we are going to be counted amongst this group that keeps the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, we must understand what it is to be patient saints. That is an absolute necessity. If you know you're a hothead, if you know that you consistently lose it and get irritated, God is saying, I can't save you like that. There's more about Jesus that we need to learn and let be lived out in our hearts because God can't save impatient people. Amen. Moses at one time got a little impatient. And it got to the point that when God said, speak to the rock, Moses struck the rock. And it caused him to lose out on that earthly Canaan. Is that right? God said, I'm not letting you in. That was pretty interesting to me. God is a serious disciplinarian. But God was so good that he knew that when Moses repented, God just said, well, I'm not going to let you in the earthly Canaan, but I am going to wake you up and bring you into the heavenly Canaan. Praise God. Thank God for his mercy. He's an amazing God. Well, here it is now that God is merciful to us. He's letting us know, I see impatience in your life, and I can't save you in your impatience, but I can save you from that impatience. Now, here's the thing. What do you think are some of the reasons why we're so impatient? Honestly, what do you think? Honestly, what do you think are some of the reasons why we're so incredibly impatient? Busy schedule. Busy schedule. So too busy. Lots going on in our lives. We, some of us have a real um, hope and belief in the Lord and expectancy, and we know he wants us to be perfect, and we have so much to expect. So it's kind of impatient waiting for that heavenly idea. We're God's people. We want it now because we can have anything we want. Impatience versus anticipation. Okay, yes? Because we want to be in control. Now, you know, I find that to be interesting. Can I help you see biblically why many of us struggle with patience? Do you believe God is a God of order? Go to 1 Corinthians 14 with me. Well, there's definitely things that we can eat that can cause us to become irritable. That's for sure. In 1 Corinthians 14, in verse 33, you remember God was counseling the brethren in the church of Corinth. And as he was counseling the brethren in the church of Corinth, God said in 1 Corinthians 14, in verse 33, he says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. God says, where there is confusion, I'm not in that. I'm not the author of that. But he says, but I am of peace. I'm, I'm, I'm of the opposite of confusion. Therefore, in verse 40, he counsels the church to do something. What does he say in verse 40? Let all things be done how? Decently and in order. So God is showing that he wants things to be done decently and in order. It was the fact that there was indecency and lack of order that created confusion, of which God says, I'm not in that. So therefore, he says, I want you to do things decently and in order because God himself is a God of order. Heaven is a place of order. We are to be a people of order. Is that right? Now, does God have an order as it relates to the ladder of grace? Then let's go to the book of 2 Peter chapter 1 and let's find out about it. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1. And I want you to notice this because it's an interesting order. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to go ahead and consider verse 4. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. The Bible says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped what? Corruption. The corruptions that are in the world through lust. And then he goes on in verse 5, say, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your what? Faith, faith what? Virtue. So which one comes first, faith or virtue? Faith. So you have to have faith first, and then after faith comes? Virtue. virtue. Then after virtue comes? Knowledge. Then after knowledge comes? Temperance. Then after temperance comes? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. What are those saints called in Revelation 14, 12? 
Patient saints. What is the great thing that God is expecting us to be? Patient, Patient saints. Well, what's the great reality that we struggle with? Patient. Impatience. And therefore, we were trying to find out, well, why am I so impatient? And you know the reason why? Because we're not temperate. Because before patience, there is temperance. Well, wait a minute. What's temperance? Temperance is self-control. That means that Ellen White was right when she said in Councils and Diets and Foods, page 50, that an intemperate man cannot be a patient man. And it's true. It's true. It's so true. The reason many of us struggle with impatience is because we're intemperate. And an intemperate person cannot be a patient person. Do you see that? An intemperate man cannot be a patient man. The Bible shows that God has an order. First comes faith, then comes virtue. Then comes knowledge, then comes temperance, then comes patience. Second Peter 1, verses 4 and 5. Yeah, it's right, right there. So therefore, that's what God wants to bring to our attention. If we are going to become patient saints, we must first learn what it is to be temperate saints. You get that? And that's why temperance is very, very important in the eyes of God. Now, how many things does God want us to be temperate in? 1 Corinthians 9.25 says, If any man strives for the mastery, he must be temperate. Notice the Bible says he must be temperate in all things. God actually expects us to practice self-control in every dynamic, in every area of our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. God expects us to have self-control in every area of our lives. And this is why we are not to be deceived when we see individuals who have very good control over their diet, but they have very bad control over their sleep patterns. You meet one person who goes to bed and they have great self-control when it comes to getting proper rest, but they have horrible self-control when it comes to keeping their bodies hydrated. You get that? So don't, we are not to allow ourselves to fall into what we call bragging points. Well, I, I eat, right? I eat the same time every day. We always find a reason to try to exalt ourselves amongst others. And this is of the, this is of the devil. Comparing, Comparing ourselves among ourselves. And the Bible says all who do so are not wise. 2 Corinthians 10, 12. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says when we compare ourselves among ourselves, we are not wise. God wants us to understand that we've got to get to a point that we have self-control over every area of our lives. Now, let's entertain a question. What is temperance? We know that the word temperance, by definition, is self-control. That's what the word temperance means. It means self-control. But we're going to look at temperance in two ways. Understanding self-control. How is self-control demonstrated in yours and my life? Number one, we have to understand that it means saying no. Part of what makes up self-control is learning how to say no. Some of us are intemperate because we are yes men. We're yes women. Anytime somebody asks something, we always say yes. yes. And many a times we will literally deprive ourselves of a connection with Jesus in the name of helping others. God never asked you to do that. You can't find one verse in the Bible or the spirit of prophecy. You know, James White was a phenomenal man, Ellen White's husband. But I thank God that James White was not my example. Amen. James White overworked himself. If you read the story of James White, he believed the message. He believed the truth. And he wanted to see people saved. But he overworked himself and made himself sick on a regular basis to the point his own wife had to tell him, you're overworking yourself. We have to understand that there's a time to say, I cannot be available. I cannot do this. So part of self-control is not just simply saying yes to everything. It's also learning how to say no. There are some things that we are asked to do in this life that many of times we have to respectfully, lovingly, and caringly 
tell even those who are dearest to our hearts, I'm sorry, I cannot do this right now. You got to learn to say no. Do you know it's a biblical principle? You see, is the devil coming after you? Of course he is. But Satan is coming after us. But, so when Satan comes after us, we should do what? Resist him. Right? But in resisting him, to resist him is to say no. Now he's going to come with all sorts of temptations. But how are we enabled to say no unto the devil? It, it, it is choosing, but there's something that has to happen in that choice that's very, very key. Notice what it says in James 4, 7. What's that first word? Submit. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Once you do that, now you have power to resist the devil, that he will flee from you. If your life is not submitted to Christ, hear me good. Look at John, the eighth chapter, please. If the life is not submitted to Christ, what Jesus said to these Jews is the same for anybody else. Notice what inspiration says. John 8 and verse 44. This is a true statement, ladies and gentlemen. This is a true statement, brothers and sisters. In John 8 and verse 44, when the life is not submitted to Christ, when we reject the light that God offers to you and I, the Bible says in John 8 and verse 44, it says, ye are of your father, the devil, and look at what he says next, and the lusts of your father you might do. He says, the lusts of your father you will do. Is that clear? If we do not have our lives submitted unto God, by default, you will do what Satan wants you to do. This is how men who said they would never be gay turn gay. This is how women who said that they would always keep themselves pure can turn into a harlot. This is how individuals who said they would never kill a human being become serial killers. When individuals' lives are not submitted to God, the lust of their father now, they will do. There is no such thing as Satan's will, God's will, my will. If we are not under the will of God, we are by default under the will of Satan. And the lusts of him we will do. You understand that? So it is, it is possible to say no to the devil, to resist him once the life is submitted to God. You got that? So part of temperance is saying no. We are enabled to do that through something, and I'll show you that in just a moment. So part of this is saying no. That's part of self-control. Another part of self-control is saying yes. There are going to be all sorts of things that you're not going to want to do. There are going to be times God is going to tell you to go tell somebody about his love and his goodness. And you're going to say, Lord, I'm scared. I don't want to do that. And God is going to encourage you to say yes. That's part of self-control. Part of self-control is saying no, but part of self-control is also saying yes. There are going to be times that God is going to tell you, take this literature and put it into the hands of these individuals and let them know that I'm coming soon. And we're going to say, Lord, that makes me uncomfortable. But brothers and sisters, you got to learn to say yes. Amen. Just because you don't want to do it does not become a license not to do it. Thank God that Jesus didn't think that way. Amen. Because there was something Jesus did not want to say yes to. You remember that Jesus said, my father... If it, is, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to do this. But thank the Lord, he, con he finished his statement by saying, Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Self-control is also saying yes. Amen. There are going to be times that you're going to have people unloving in your life, and God is going to call you to be lovable to them. And everything in your heart is going to say no when God is calling you to say yes. And this is why we can claim a beautiful promise from the book Early Writings, page 72. In Early Writings, page 72, it says, faith is ours to exercise. When God tells you to do something, he says, I didn't ask you to feel it. God says, do it anyhow. And then when we exercise faith and do what God says, now the second sentence comes in. It says, faith is ours to exercise, but joyful feeling and the blessing is God's to give to us. 
You get that? So faith is ours to exercise. Joyful feeling and the blessing is God's to give to us. So just because you don't feel it, that's from early writings, page 72. So just because you don't feel it does not mean that that's the spirit of God telling you not to do it. Sometimes it's self. So we have to know the voice of God, and we have to know that when God is telling us to do something, don't be like Jonah. Don't wait for a whale to swallow you up. Don't wait for the whales of life to take you in and put you in trying circumstances before you finally say yes. You know, Ellen White was told to go on a mission. Ellen White was told to go on a mission with her husband, to go ahead and share the gospel, but she had a little baby. You read this in volume one of the testimonies. She had a little baby, and, in the, and when she had that little baby, she said, Lord, I have to be home with my baby. I got to be home with my baby. And all of a sudden, that baby started getting sick, and they tried everything to help that baby, and nothing worked. And the baby kept getting more and more and more sick. And it got to the point that eventually Ellen White began to pray and to seek God's wisdom. And the Lord revealed to her, I have sent you on a mission. And if you are going to let your child frustrate you from going on the mission I've sent you to, I will remove him. When Ellen White realized that, she went to her husband, James, and said, God has been allowing our child to get sick because we have allowed our child to stop us from going to share what God has told us to share. Once they cooperated with God and said, we will go, and James and Ellen White agreed to go, you read it in volume one of the testimonies, all of a sudden, the baby started getting well. And they left. It hurt, brothers and sisters, for her to do that. It hurt for her to do that. But there are going to be times that God will even call family members away from one another for a period of time so that the gospel may be furthered, Amen. so that the people may know the truth as it is in Jesus. And you know, when she left that baby behind, that baby was in good hands. She came back, I believe it was four to five years later and came back to her baby and was reunited. No, she couldn't. You must understand, brothers and sisters, that God is going to call you to say yes. And sometimes that saying yes may call you things that you cherish, things that you love, things that are so incredibly important to you. And God may say, I'm calling you. Will you go? There's a hymn that says, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord, or mountain or plain or sea. I will say what you want me to say, dear Lord. I'll be what you want me to be. You got to learn to say yes. You got to learn to say no. Both of these are demonstrations of self-control. You understand that? Amen? Amen. Amen? How do we get this temperance? How do we get this temperance? The ability... The, the, to be able to say yes when God calls us to say yes, to be able to say no when God calls us to say no, cannot be done by might or by power. It can only be done by his spirit. And I'm not saying that because that sounds cool. What I'm telling you is the truth. I'm saying that because the only way that you and I can get temperance is we have to get temperance from the one who owns temperance. And inspiration says in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, it says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness and temperance. Against such, there is no law. It is the Holy Spirit of God that houses temperance within his bosom. And the only way you and I can get the kind of temperance where we can be temperate in all things, we need that Holy Spirit. We need the Spirit of God in our hearts, in our homes. Amen? Well, we can talk about that. My sister was asking how can we know when we finally get victorious in, in, our, in, in, in experiencing temperance and so on. Obviously, there should be a very clear change.
You will be surprised. There are times that I remember being a young, uh, uh, 20 years ago when I joined the church, probably about two years into the church, I had a very hot, fiery attitude. I was the kind of guy that if you got me mad, you would know about it. I'd let you know. And um, there was something guys used to do. There used to be this thing in New York where if two guys are walking towards each other, one guy would use his shoulder and he would go like this, and he hit the other guy with his shoulder. If the other guy hits, hits you with the shoulder, that was their way of initiating a fight. They're, they're basically letting you know, I want to fight you, when they would do that. Now, I actually told my mother and my father that the day that somebody does that to me, I will kill them in broad, deadlight, in, in broad daylight in front of a police officer. I was trying to get across to my mother and my father, I'm not afraid to die and I'm ready to kill somebody if they get me mad enough. My parents became very afraid. They thought their son is crazy, he's going to die. Well, I had a very bad, I wasn't a wild child, but I had a bad temper. I was a pretty nice guy, but if you got me mad enough, this, there was a beast within that would come out. We all have a beast in us. We all have a beast in us. And what we must do is let Jesus mortify that beast. You understand that? That beast is called self. Now, here it is that one day I'm in the church, I'm learning about Jesus and his love and his goodness. And here it is that one day after church service was over, on a Saturday night, I'm walking down the street. And as I'm walking down the street, uh, me and my friends from church, there's some guys walking towards us. As the guys start walking towards us, I'm walking, just enjoying the blessings of a nice Sabbath day. And next thing you know, as I walk by, the guy goes, boom, and he hits my shoulder. When he hit my shoulder, I remember getting hit, and then I remember looking at him. And then he looked at me, and he was looking like, like this. He was doing like, so you want to fight? I'm ready to fight. And when I looked at him, I knew in my mind intellectually, I'm supposed to hurt this guy right now. But there was a peace in my mind that was overpowering my intellect. And that peace in my mind was like, let it go. I looked at the guy, and he's waiting for me to respond, and I look at him, and I say, sorry about that. I guess I wasn't paying attention. Have a good night. And walk the other way. When I walked the other way, the first words that came out of my mouth is, God has got to be real. Because I knew intellectually that was a death moment. Mm -hmm. My parents sent me to karate school because they felt I had a bad temper. That was the worst decision they could have made because all that, all that did was just make me know how to kill you quicker. Mm -hmm. That's all it did. So now I knew how to take your life with one shot where maybe I had to use five or ten shots before. So karate didn't do anything. So karate made me more boastful. It made me feel like I have more power now. So to watch this guy and to know that I can knock him out with one kick and yet for God to give me the peace to be able to say, forgive me, I'm sorry, and move on. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives because he's in my heart. Amen. You get that? So you, can, you, you may not know when was the first day that this power entered into your life. You won't know that, but it will be so incredibly evident that as Ellen White says, even you as God's workers will be surprised at the power of the gospel. And so it is that I can't mark for you and say this will happen at that time. But you'll notice changes in your life and the way you respond to crisis and different things. You'll be able to see, wow, because the real us always comes out in a crisis. When we're nice to each other, everybody typically acts nice. But it's when, when things get bad, that's when the real test of character kicks in. How are you going to behave now now that this person's mean to you, nasty to you, or whatever? Are you still going to snap on them? Are you still going to mouth off? Are you still going to talk behind their back? Or are you going to actually pray for them? and still be kind and loving. When you find yourself doing things like that, praying for people who are your enemies, you, you literally know you're shaking the hand of somebody that you knew just stabbed you in your back, and when you shake their hand, you're actually genuinely concerned for them. This is how God starts to help you and I see Jesus has got to be real because only God can change a heart. You get that? So you'll know. You will know. It'll be evidences that even you as God's worker will be surprised. And so we find that the temperance work is a very, very important work. Now let's notice some things Ellen White says. She says there needs to be a great reformation on the subject of temperance. That's why we're talking about temperance. Because now we see that in order for us to experience the power of the third angel's message, we need to become what kind of saints? Patience. We need to become patient saints, but before we're patient saints, we have to first become temperate, temperate saints. Amen? 
So therefore, there's a need. To be, there needs to be a great reformation on the subject of temperance. The world is filled with self-indulgence of every kind. Is this not true? It says, because of the benumbing influence of stimulants and narcotics, the minds of many are unable to discern between the sacred and the common. Their mental powers are weakened, and they cannot discern the deep spiritual things of the word of God. That is true in the physical. That is true in the spiritual. There's also spiritual wine that the Bible talks about, false doctrines. The more that people keep drinking and partaking of false doctrines, the more they hear straight truth, they're going to not understand it. They're going to be able to say, I can't see the difference between the sacred and the common. This is why God says, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city. Come out of her, my people, and partake not of her sins and receive not of her plagues, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And so it is that as it is true in the physical, it is true in the spiritual. Notice, the Christian will be temperate in all things, in eating, drinking, dress. Isn't that interesting? And in every phase of life. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. We have no right to indulge in how many things? Anything. We have no right to indulge in anything that will result in a condition of mind that hinders the Spirit of God from impressing us with the sense of our duty. It is a masterpiece of satanic skill to place men where they can with difficulty be reached with the gospel. Shall there not be among us a people, of a people as a people, a revival of the temperance work? Do you see how Ellen White has a, a great uh, push for the temperance work? Now, you're going to find out something about Ellen White you probably didn't know. Ellen White, did you know that the subject of temperance was her favorite subject? You're about to see that quote. The subject of temperance was her favorite subject. And I want you to see who she shared temperance with. See, because we see how important temperance is, right? Are we to share the third angel's message with the world or just Seventh-day Adventists? With the, world. with the world, right? Okay. But in order to experience the third angel's message, we must also learn to be what kind of saints? Patient, patient saints. But in order to be patient saints, we must be? Temperate. temperate saints. So notice how she's stressing temperance. She says... With the great light that God has entrusted to us, we should be in the forefront of every true reform, not New Agers. You understand that? Let's, let, let's stop letting them slap us in the face when they're doing the work God gave us to do. It goes on to say the use of drug liquors is making men mad and leading them to commit the most horrible crimes. Because of the wickedness that follows largely as the result of the use of liquor, the judgments of God are falling upon our earth today. Now, this is interesting. Is this the opinion of a little old lady from the 1800s with a third grade education? Or is this the testimony of Jesus? Yes. I want you to think about this. Jesus inspired the mind of Ellen White to say, because of the wickedness that follows largely as the result of the use, use of, what's another way of saying liquor? Alcohol. Alcohol. Now Jesus is saying, because of the wickedness that follows largely as the result of the use of liquor, the judgments of God are falling upon our earth today. Why, what is one of the reasons the judgments of God are falling upon our earth today? Because of the use of liquor. What's another word for liquor? Now, how in the world can we believe that Jesus would feed people liquor at a wedding and then go ahead and inspire his prophet to say, but because people drink it and use it, that he is pulling judgments on the world today? You talk about two-faced? If ever there was a, hip, a, hip, a hypocritical position, it would be that. How could God give people liquor at a wedding and then he's going to go ahead and pour judgments on the earth because now people are using it? No, Elder, listen, because of the wickedness that follows largely as the result of the use of liquor. The wickedness, the wickedness that's in the world is a result of the use of liquor, alcohol, wine is alcohol. So the judgments of God are falling upon our earth today. Yeah, the result. That's right. That's the point. So it says, have we not a solemn responsibility to put forth earnest efforts in opposition to this great what? Evil. What's the great evil? Alcohol. The use of liquor. 
liquor, alcohol, wine, wine coolers, beer, whatever you want to call it. It's the same thing, brothers and sisters. It has the same benumbing effects. And even and the world says it. When I was in um, sixth grade, they told us one sip of alcohol kills thousands of brain cells. Hello, and God would give that at a wedding? No, no, no. Now, here we go. Ellen White stressed. Write it down. Write it down. Don't forget it. Ellen White stressed the importance of the temperance work. Notice where she began to teach the importance of the temperance work. On Sunday, June 23rd, 1878, I spoke in the... What's Ellen White doing in the Methodist church? She says, I spoke in the Methodist church of Salem, Oregon, on the subject of what? When Ellen White, a seven-day Adventist, was speaking in a Sunday church about the temperance or health message? What? You mean to tell me we have an example, even through God's servant, that she was found in Sunday churches teaching on the subject of health and temperance? The attendance was unusually good. And I had freedom in treating this my what? Favorite. Told you, temperance is her favorite subject. She says, I was requested to speak again in the same place on the Sunday following the camp meeting, but was prevented by hoarseness. On the next Tuesday evening, however, I again spoke in this church. Many invitations were tendered me to speak on temperance in various cities and towns of Oregon, but the state of my health forbade my complying with these requests. Ellen White was invited to Sunday churches to speak on the subject of health and temperance. Amen. Interesting. Let's go on. LLM stands for Loma Linda Messages. During a series of meetings held later, late in the year 1899 at Maitland, New South Wales, I was requested by the president of the Maitland branch of the WCTU. I wonder what the WCTU is. You're going to find out in just a moment. Notice that Ellen White was requested by the president of the Maitland branch of the WCTU to speak to them one evening. It says she said that they would be very glad to hear me even if I should speak only 10 minutes. I asked her if the 10 minutes that she proposed for me to speak was all the time that was allowed because sometimes the spirit of the Lord came upon me and I had more than a 10 minutes talk to give. Oh, she said, your people, she's talking about 70 other, your people told me that you did not speak in the evening and I specified 10 minutes as the time thinking that I would not get you at all if I made it longer. The longer you can speak to us, the more thankful we shall be. The people who were part of the Sunday movement said we would be thankful if you can come to our churches and our organizations and teach us on health and temperance. You following this so far? I asked Mrs. Winter, the president, if it was her custom to read a portion of scriptures at the opening of the meeting. She said that it was. I then asked for the privilege of praying, which was gladly granted. I spoke with freedom to them for an hour, not 239 hours, that's a page. <laughs> some of the women, some of the women present that night afterward attended the meetings in the tent. Now you gotta understand what just happened. Ellen White went to one place governed by the Sunday churches, spoke on health and temperance. The people loved what she taught so much that when she had to go to our tent and camp meetings, she says some of the women present that night afterward attended the meetings. In other words, the Seventh-day Adventists came into the midst of the, those who worship on Sunday, taught on the wonderful subject of health and temperance. The people were so blessed by what they heard from that instrument that they began to inquire, what else does that instrument know? And then went to the next location. You get that? We need at this time to show a decided interest in the workers of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, WCTU. You can look that up. It says, none who claim to have a part in the work of God should lose interest in the grand object of this organization in temperance lines. 
It says it would be a good thing if at our camp meetings we should invite the members of the WCTU to take part in our exercises. It says this would help them to become acquainted with the reasons of our faith and open the way for us to unite with them in the temperance work. If we will do this, we shall come to see that the temperance question means more than many of us have supposed. Because what do we learn about temperance tonight? It's connected to the, the third angel's message. That's what she's talking about. She's saying they'll learn more about temperance than what they think they understand already. Do you see what's happening? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? All right. In some matters, the workers of the WCTU are far in advance of our leaders. Now, that's true. You will find that in the Sunday churches today, there are many individuals in many respects who know more about God than many Seventh-day Adventists. It's sad. God has given this movement higher light, but many of us have hated this light. We've turned away from it ourselves, many of us. And it's strange because many of us, we're looking to Babylon to get educated. But here it is that sometimes those folks, even though they're in darkness on certain points, even though they're in darkness on certain points, they are more faithful to what they know to be truth than many of us. This is why Ellen White herself said the largest body of Christians are outside of the Seventh-day Adventist church. This is very serious. Now, it says the Lord has in that organization precious souls who can be a great help to us in our efforts to advance the temperance movement. And the education our people have had in Bible truth and in a knowledge of the requirements of the law of Jehovah will enable our sisters to impart to these noble temperance advocates that which will be for their spiritual welfare. Thus, a union and sympathy will be created where in the past there has sometimes existed prejudice and misunderstanding. Do you see what can happen? When we begin working with the brethren in these churches, the prejudices, the misunderstandings, they'll be able to say, man, this is what a seven-day Adventist is. I always thought you were these strange folks that just go to church on Saturday and don't eat pork. But wow, you're actually loving Christian people who love Jesus, live by his word, and follow his truth. I didn't know that about you. So it removes prejudice, breaks down the walls of barriers, and so on. It says, I have been surprised as I have seen the indifference of some of our leaders to this organization. We cannot do a better work than to unite so far as we can do so without compromise with the WCTU workers. So do you see this? So the point that I want to bring across to us is that God wanted us to understand that there is a great work that was done in times past in the Advent movement where we actually worked with those in the Sunday churches to minister to them in an area of need, which was health and temperance, and then they would get a chance to see how and who Seventh-day Adventists really are, and from that, an attraction would come to the point that they would even start coming to some of our meetings, learning about all these wonderful gospel truths, and then as a result of that, they would actually join the remnant family of God. Amen. This was a method. This was a method. And that's why this class has been put together on how to work in the first day churches, bringing the subject of health and temperance to the people. It's a repeat of what worked with the pioneers. You get that? So that's why I'm not just putting this class together just to do it as something great. It's a part of our work. It was a part of our past success. You follow that? All right. Now, understanding that, I'm going to blank that out for a second. You're grabbing your document. Health plan for church communities. How many of you do not have this? Okay. In order for us to uh, work with, you know, many of these churches, this program, this right here is a Word document. Now, if you would like, I can give you all a soft copy of this as well. This is designed, and, and I think one of the reasons why I want to give you, when I say soft copy, I mean electronic, email. I can email it to you. Good. So the reason why I want you to get a soft copy is because I want you to edit this. You notice you see Dwayne and Alexandra Lemon. You know you're not Dwayne and Alexandra Lemon, right? So. No, 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 no. So what I want you to see is that you can actually use a document like this, but you can edit it according to your liking. This is what we're going to call a solicitation document. 
The purpose of this document is so that it can be something that can be put into the hands of the powers that be in any type of first day organization, we're going to typically say church, that you can go ahead and minister to these individuals. You can let them know who you are, what you are doing, what your work is about, and so on. That's the purpose of this document. This is a document that has not been put together for testing purposes. This is a document that was actually used. Okay, so in other words, this worked. So I'm not giving you something that's just nice or a great idea. This is something that worked. And what you're going to find is that we need to just go ahead and look at some different things here. Now, rules of engagement. I'm going to use, let me see if this red writes good. Nope. Now, again, this is a document. This, do you understand what I say when I say this is a solicitation document? You know what I mean when I say solicitation? Like a proposal. In other words, you want to create a relationship with a church. You want to have an opportunity to go share God's wonderful message of health reform in a church. Okay? When you do that, you need to let them know something. You need to let them know what you're doing or how you plan on doing it. This is the document that can help you. Again, you can edit it however you choose. This is a model. That's all this is, is a model. What you do is you take this document and you simply go to the Baptist church, the Pentecostal church, the Roman Catholic church. It doesn't matter. The Jehovah's Witnesses. You can go wherever you want. Mormons. You can go wherever you want. And you basically are going to let them know, hello, my name is, and you're going to go ahead and give a greeting. So we're going to do this. What you would do with this is you would give a greeting. Obviously, this is where you start. No. As a matter of fact, we're not even going to go to the greeting yet. The first thing you would want to do is get or develop a list of churches. You want to develop a list of churches. When you develop your list of churches, you can do that by phone book, internet, associations. Some of us have spouses that go to other churches. Some of us have friends family members that go to other churches. So, whether through the phone book, the internet, or associations, you want to go ahead and start developing a list of churches that you would like to visit in your immediate area of where you live. You can make them as diverse as others. Methodist churches are very good churches. Why? Exactly. Not only because Sister White used to be a Methodist, but the majority of Seventh-day Adventists, uh, many of them came out of the Methodist church. So Methodism, as well as Seventh-day Adventism, we have a lot of similarities. So therefore, sometimes the Methodist church is a good place to start. Um, some of the churches, it's getting a little bit more difficult because if you go to the typical charismatic churches where they do a lot of glossolalia, tongue speaking, and they do a lot of the uh, external exercises to demonstrate their religion, and here you are as a Seventh-day Adventist where you're not moving and as hyped up as they are, some of them might find that offensive. We don't compromise our position. We stand where we stand. But again, sometimes immediate prejudices could come up, you know? So therefore, you just start to think in your mind, where are some of the more church environments that I can work with that might be more accessible? Roman Catholics. Roman Catholics have some of the most reverent worship to date. Roman Catholic, you don't find Roman Catholics running all up and down their aisles and people with their skirts. I mean, I, I literally come from a Pentecostal background where there's a lot of the tongue speaking and all those things. And I remember pe literally people would be falling out and getting slain in the spirit. Sometimes they fall out, their skirts are falling back. You can see the woman's legs in her underwear. And, I mean, you literally, people, I'm serious, because in their mind, the spirit of God is taking control now. So supposedly, the Spirit of God is taking so control of you, you're running, da, da, da. I've seen people fall, I've seen people bang their heads, I've seen all sorts of things, and this is all being done in the name of the Spirit. But nevertheless, that's what some people do. But when you go to the Roman Catholic Church, you find that there's still a high level of reverence in the sanctuary. There is no chewing gum in the sanctuary. You know, there is not all of this getting up, moving around all the time. It's very reverent. So there's similarities that we can find with different organizations that might create conversation and atmospheres where we can go ahead and start with them. Well, anyhow, the goal is make a list of churches. Muslim? Even Muslims. Absolutely. Everybody's, everybody's sick and everybody needs help. So we can help them. Phone book, internet, associations. Associations, in my opinion, are the best. 
um, because that can become a warm call instead of a cold call. If I have somebody who knows a pastor, a bishop, a priest, or somebody in a church, and I say, hey, can you, you know, introduce me to them so I can let them know about this program, that's great. That obviously is an easy door because now this, it's a warm call. They have a medium. That minister and you have a medium in between. That's the mediatory one that's bringing you into them. That's now turned it into a warm call. The minister is going to be more apt to listen, listening to you. Anyhow, so you have your list of churches. So you say, all right, I got 10 churches that I want to go ahead and visit, and I want to offer what I'm going to share with them. Well, then obviously, after you do that, you want to develop a greeting. Your greeting should be something very simple and to the point. People are busy. People are busy. So you don't want to go ahead and give them a laundry list of, hello, my name is, this is what I do, this is who I am, this is why I'm here, this is why I believe, this is why I such and such. You, know, you don't want to do that. Your, your, your intro could be very, very brief. Hello, my name is Dwayne Lemon. I just wanted to find out, if I wanted to talk with someone about doing a health program at your church, who would that be? It can just be as simple as that. Oh, that would be Bishop Arlington. You know? So, again, in your greeting, hello, you give them your name, and your reason for coming. That's simple. Hello, my name is, the reason I'm here is because blank. I'd like to talk with someone in relation to a health program for your church. Obviously, you want to have your document ready. So then that way you can say, this is basically some information that we would like to share with you about how we can allow your church to become a citadel of health and wellness. You know, you say those things that just, you know, kind of makes them say, wow, okay, appreciate that. So therefore, you're going to them, you're going to let them know your reason for coming. I'm here because I want to talk to you about how we can allow your church to become a place that is known for health and wellness. Tell me about it. And you walk them through your program. You walk them through your program. Key things when you're walking through the program. Let's make sure we do this right. If the person is not there, you greet, you want to talk to the person and they're not there, then the next thing is get proper contact and then set an appointment. If the person is not there that you need to talk to, then go ahead and get the proper contact. Who would I talk to about a, pro a project like this? They say bishop so-and-so, priest so-and-so, pastor so-and-so, elder so-and-so. Then you say, all right, you get that proper contact, you contact them and set an appointment. When you contact them, same greeting. The only difference is you're not going to be able to give them the, doc the, the document directly, so therefore you're going to have to say, I'd like to meet with you so we can review this document that I wanted to share with your usher when you were not there or what have you. But you get your proper contact, you set your appointment. When you set your appointment, bring... The materials you are going to use in your seminar. Bring the materials that you're going to use in the seminar when you go to the appointment. Your books. Your books. The key books. Oh, I wish I had a bigger uh, thing here. <laughs> All right, write this down. Well, I don't want to erase it because, you know, I want you all to be able to get it and everything. But uh, I re yeah. Okay. The key books that you want to bring, your foods encyclopedias. The reason you want to bring your food encyclopedias is because you know for a fact you're going to be educating them on food. You know you're going to, you're going to do that. So bring your foods encyclopedias. It would be recommended, if you're going to teach the people herbs, then you may want to invest in the medicinal plants encyclopedias. I would highly recommend using health power. Okay, did you all get these? Did you all get this here? 
Because I, I, I feel a need to erase this, because i got to get more in. No. Okay, let me see if I can do it. I don't want to erase it, but... Okay, watch this. You're bringing your... You're bringing foods, plants. I'm putting HP for health power. Bible. Now, I did this. You don't have to do this. Here's what I did. I included Ministry of Healing and Steps to Christ. That's what I did. That's what I used. Okay? Now, somebody says, well, Brother Lemon, why didn't you use the Natural Remedies Encyclopedia? There was a reason for that. True story. Working at my job, and I met with, uh, I, I, was what call, I was what was called a major account executive for a company called Charter Communications. I sold fiber optic networks. I was a salesman. I was a major account salesperson, so I worked with very big, large organizations. And what I would do is I would just go from company to company. I usually sat down with people who were CEOs, chief executive officers, chief financial officers, and chief information officers, a lot of the C-level people, as we called it. Now, these were decision makers. These were the guys who typically wrote the check and said, we want your product, okay? The product that I sold always cost up to hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. Now, in doing this, I was required to have an engineer with me everywhere I go. So that way, when you want to talk financial and business, you talk to me. When you want to talk technical, you talk to him. So I would point them to the engineer guy. All right, so my engineer's name was Michael, and Michael... You know, Michael would always sit with me in my car, and my car was my sanctuary. That's where I used to play my CDs and music and different things. So, you know, if you're in my car, you're in my church. So, as far as I'm concerned, you're in my church, you're going to hear the message. So, we were in the car, and we would ride together to different meetings, and Mike and I would just talk, and then one day, he's here, he knows that I'm a Christian, he's a Christian too. He's a part of the Baptist church. So, we shared lots of things. Well, one day, Mike was taking pills, and I was wondering, I said, why are you taking that? He says, I have high blood pressure. I said, you have high blood pressure? He said, yeah. I said, listen, how long do you want to have it? And then he kind of looked at me a little weird. He was like, what do you mean, how long do I want to have it? I said, that's right, how long do you want to have it? And then he said, well, I don't want to have it. I said, so when do you plan on getting rid of it? And he said, I can't. That's at least what my doctor told me. I said, what if you found out that wasn't true? And then he said, all right, talk to me. Started walking him through some steps. When I walked him through the steps, he was so impressed that he ended up calling his brother. His brother happened to be a pastor, the senior pastor of a 4,000-member megachurch in Atlanta, Georgia, Baptist Church. He told his brother about me. His brother calls me, the pastor. He says, hello, my brother has told me about uh, some health teachings that you shared with him, and I liked what I heard so much, I wanted to know if you could introduce this to my congregation. I said, okay. He says, when can we talk about this? I said, call me back at this time. So we set up a time to talk. He called me back, and we started talking. Now, watch this. He said, okay, so what do you have to offer? I said, well, basically what we do is we talk about how individuals can overcome various forms of sickness and disease, what we call WDLDs, Western Debilitating Lifestyle Diseases. Many people are not aware that, unfortunately, our lifestyle habits can invite disease, but a reverse of lifestyle habits, by the grace of God, can get rid of it. So what we do is we really teach people on the point of lifestyle. And then he said, do you use any information? Or, you know, what, what he, no. Here's the question he asked. What degree do you have? What degree do I have? I said, PhD. I praise him daily. <laughs> you know, I didn't say that. What I, what I did say, I said, well, I said, I do not have a degree. But all of what I teach and share are from the people with degrees. That's why I use books. Because I'm telling you right now, if you're going to sit in the midst of congregations like I have, where you're sitting with doctors, you're sitting with people who make hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars, and they are successful neurosurgeons, nurses, physical therapists, and the list goes on, who are you to try to come and teach them about health? That's the natural psychology. 
Now, volume four of the testimony to the church, page 67, says that in the work of soul winning, there are two things that we need to understand, the human mind and human nature. So the natural human mind is going to say, who are you to teach me? So I have to understand that. That's why I don't care how much I have stored in my brain, I'm still going to teach through books. So when I told him, I said, I quote the doctors, pastor. He then said, well, what books do you use? Now, if I said the natural remedies encyclopedia, he would have did what he did when I told him this. My answer was, I said, well, pastor, I use uh, the foods encyclopedia. And as soon as I said foods encyclopedia, you could hear over the phone this. <laughs> what was he doing? He was checking out what I was talking about. Now, what if I said, I use the Natural Remedies Encyclopedia? He would have went, Harvest Time Books, National Sunday Law, what? What? Doctrine? Uh, you get that? You see that? Proverbs 11 and verse 30 says, He who wins souls is wise. I was not going to use a book that I know is saturated all over the internet and can lead people right back to the source because most of the times when you use the NRE, it's not a bad book. It's a great book. It's a very good book. But the truth of the matter is that book is loaded with doctrine. And what happens is you can go to certain websites and it's highlighted. It teaches the sanctuary, the Sabbath, and this, that, and the other. So if you tell a pastor on the intro level before they even get to know you and they research the book, they may say, oh, no, 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 you're trying to indoctrinate my people. Boop. You get that? So therefore, I told him, food's encyclopedia. He did. I said, yeah, you know, these books, they talk about this, that, that. He said, yeah, I see them right here, right in front of me. I'm watching it. I'm looking at it right now. That's exactly what he said to me. He said, I'm looking at it right now. I said, and he said, oh, yeah, these, wow, 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 these books look great. That's all he said. That's all he said because it's a foods book. It, it just deals with food, okay? So when he saw that, he said, this is very interesting. Come down to my office. I said, no problem, pastor. Now, when I went to his office, I brought my hot shots. These are what we're going to call your upfront books. We're going to call this your up front books. This is what you're going to go up front before the congregation and teach from. These are your up front books. You got that? These books, for the most part, are very neutral. Now, foods deals with food. Plants deals with herbs. Health power, it deals with disease. Okay, but it shows how to redirect via lifestyle. The Bible, they're not offended by that because obviously they have Bibles in their church. Now, Ministry of Healing, Steps to Christ. Why did I use those books? The reason I use those books is because stress is a major issue of why we have so much sickness and disease. Steps to Christ shows individuals how to have a walk with Jesus on how to overcome that stress. So therefore, that's why I use Steps to Christ. Ministry of Healing teaches lifestyle principles of how to walk with Jesus and take him with you in the day-to-day -day living experiences of life. That's why I brought those two books. You don't have to. I did. Oh, Steps to Christ helps deal with the stress because it shows people how to have a walk with Jesus so that they can know how to have elimination of stress. Okay? Oh, yeah, I did. I'm going to show you. Now, Ministry of Healing. When I did Ministry of Healing, Ministry of Healing I included because I said this will show practical examples of how Christians can take Jesus with them in the day-to-day -day circumstances of life. In Ministry of Healing, there's a whole chapter on uh, contact, contacts and daily living. That's a chapter. That's a whole chapter in Ministry of Healing. Um, there's another chapter called Mind Cure. So we talked to the pastor. We said, Pastor, this book, Ministry of Healing, helps us understand that there are many individuals that disease really begins in the mind. So we also are going to help them understand. I said, and, and I'll give them a scientific fact. I'll say, Pastor, have you ever heard of the placebo test? Have you ever heard of the sugar pill? And he's going to probably say no. Say, yeah, the hospitals, all these different places, universities, they started to give people sugar pills. All it was was a pill with a little bit of sugar and water in it. And what they would do is they would tell people, you have a certain ailment, and uh, we found out that this pill can help you get better. 
and they would go ahead and give them the pill. All that was in the pill was sugar and water. And the people would go ahead and take the pill, and after a week, the doctors would say, how you doing? Man, I feel so much better. And they didn't realize all they took was what was called a placebo, just a sugar pill. There was, no nutri there was no virtue in that that could bring healing for the ailment. And then what the doctors showed them is, your disease was in your head. And that's why Proverbs 17, 22, a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. So many diseases start in the mind, and many diseases can be cured in the mind, and that's why Ministry of Healing has a chapter called Mind Cure. You get that? So, that's what I use as my package. I show them that these are my upfront books. Okay? Now, what I also bring to the pastor are my consultation books. Your consultation books will include all of your upfront books, but in addition, it'll be conflict series, maybe some children's books, maybe some cookbooks. Now, you bring those two up front? I do, but what I do with these is I bring them in a portfolio form or I take a picture maybe from the internet that has all those books and then I go ahead and do this. Now I'm going to tell you a science that I did. What I did is I showed, I said, Pastor, this is what I'm going to be using up front to teach your people. Okay? You use these from up front. You remember when we did the high blood pressure and the arthritis? Remember we did those presentations? Those are actual presentations that I used um, at those churches. They're much, much more in depth. I only gave you snapshots of them. But nevertheless, they're much, much more in depth. So what I do is I just teach from the PowerPoint. I reference from the books. I use, sometimes the students will even register and get those books. And it will become part of their registration. And then what will happen is I'll say, turn to your textbook, Health Power, page 42. And then we'll all turn to page 42 and we read together. People like to register for things and get products in their hands. It makes them feel like they're really in a class. They're getting something valuable. All right. Well, anyhow, these are the upfront books that I use. Now, the pastor called me. You have to be prepared for this. The pastor called me two weeks into the meeting. We did seven weeks with them. The pastor called me two weeks into the meetings. He says, Dwayne, I have a problem. I said, what's your problem, pastor? He says, my problem is, is that my elders are not happy with me uh, for having you here. And uh, they are very upset. I said, pastor, why are they upset? He said, the reason they're upset is because of those books you keep using. And I said, what problem would they have with the foods encyclopedia, pastor? And I said that because I knew that their problem was not with the foods. Uh -huh. I knew that their problem was with these two. So I said, Pastor, what problem would they have with the foods? He said, they don't have a problem with the foods. They have a problem with those books that were written by Ellen White. I said, is that right, Pastor? He said, yes. I said, well, what is it that's so wrong? What is it that they have a problem with? And this is what he said. He said, Dwayne, I don't have any problem with those books. Those books are wonderful. Ministry of Healing Steps to Christ are real easy books for people to read that even the most modern Christians will not have a problem with these books. He said, my problem, I said, so what's wrong with the books if you don't like them? He says, my problem is that I, I, I think they're great. He says, but that's the problem. I said, wait a minute, what's the problem? He said, the problem is, is that they're great. <laughs> and the elders are concerned because they're concerned that if the members of our church discover how wonderful Ellen White's writings are on this book, they will be interested in knowing what other books did she write. This is literally what he told me. He said, Dwayne, they have threatened to fire me if I don't stop you from using those books. Now, I could have said, Pastor... I'm a Seventh-day Adventist, and I'm not selling out on our literature. Either you work with the program or I walk. You think that was my attitude? No. Back in the days. <laughs> Back in the days. I said, Pastor, what you will find is that the writings of Ellen White are like a magnifying glass. Does a magnifying glass put something there that wasn't there, Pastor? He said, no. I said, does a magnifying glass take away something that was there? No. 
I said, a magnifying glass only makes clear that which was already there. Isn't that right, Pastor? He said, that's right. I said, so you will find with Ellen White's writing. She just simply makes points that are already in the Bible. She just makes it more clear to those who have struggles seeing. Pastor, it is not a problem for me to remove those books. I'll make all the same points from these books straight from the Bible. I want to encourage you in your study life that you will learn how to believe the writings of the prophet but know where she got her thoughts from in the Bible. Amen. We are not like Mormons. The Mormons believe that the Bible is an incomplete book. Therefore, there was a need for the Book of Mormons so that it can bring a complete message. That's not the Seventh-day Adventist position. We believe that Ellen White's writings are authoritative because it is inspired under the same spirit of God, yet we understand that her writings are simply a magnification of what the Bible already says. Ellen White herself told us, the only reason for my writings to even come into existence is because God's people were not studying the Bible the way that they should. So therefore, I told the pastor, I said, every point that I'm going to make from Ellen White's books, I'll make it straight from the Bible. Is that all right? He said, no problem. So we continued. Be prepared for that if you choose to use books inspired by Ellen White. When it came to these books here, the conflict series, I said, Pastor, here's a list. And I just showed him a paper with all the pictures of the Conflict of the Ages series, all the pictures of the children's books and the cookbooks. I said, here's a list of books that we would use in uh, consultations with your members because some members have children. So sometimes the children books help them so that they can come to know Jesus better. Cookbooks are very helpful. The Conflict series is wonderful books that help individuals to understand different dynamics of the life of Jesus. And then I highlight Desire of Ages. Desire of Ages by the Library of Congress was recognized as the best documentary ever written on the life of Christ. You know, so you share those little points with them. So they say, hmm. Wow. And if, Pastor, if you'd like, I can bring any of these specific books in so that you can read them and look them through just in case you would like to do that. I respect that, Pastor. But do you know what they usually say? That's not necessary. Now, what I've done is I've been upfront with him. Have I not? And because I'm upfront with him, he can't get mad at me if one of his members reads Great Controversy and says, I found the truth, Pastor. Because I told him, what I, I told him that I was going to bring it in there, right? Okay. Now, from this, you have introduced what you're going to use, and now, basically, you're in the presentation mode. So up front, you're going to give presentations. Up front, you're going to give presentations. When you finish your presentations, here's what you're going to do next. Here's what you're going to do next. You're going to have a card of some kind. With the card, it's going to have your ministry name, and it's going to have something like this on it. This is what you're going to use. You'll get this DVD. So that way, either you'll get the DVD or I'll email this to you so that way you don't have to write this down, okay? So you're going to give them a card that has your ministry name. You're going to have diabetes, hypertension. You're going to have these things where they can go ahead and say, I would like to have a one-on-one -on -one lifestyle consultation for the following. And they can go ahead and check that, all right? Now, let me say some things on the back end because I'm going to take you all the way up. Forgive me if, if, you, if I did not give you a break, but I knew that there was going to be a lot in this class, so forgive me for that, okay? What we're going to do is this. You're going to go ahead and use this as your consultation card because your goal is to get a consultation. You're just using the upfront as the means to get into the home. You want to get into the home because that's where you can really meet the need of the person. Remember, that's the goal of medical missionary work, to meet the need, right? What are you seeking? Okay, now, I guess I'll put this in there now. We'll talk Thursday about compensation. Because, remember, I told you that I'm going to show you how principles of how we can support ourselves in the work. This is a very powerful self-supporting tool right here. Very powerful. Um, when we went to that pastor, the pastor said, how much does this cost? I said, pastor, we don't charge anything for this. What we do is we simply make our income through the purchase of books that people will find relevant for their homes. Okay? Canvassing. Now, the pastor said, I will not allow you to serve my people and not pay you. That's what the pastor said to me. I said, you don't have to pay us. I said, we'll make our income, if anything, through the books that we share. He said, no one serves my people and not get compensated for it. I wish we could get more 70 Adventist pastors to think like that. 
Um, I said, he said, you have to come up with a price. I said, Pastor, we don't know a price to come up with. We don't charge for this. He said, I refuse to let you do this for free. Go home, pray about it, think about it, come up with a price. Well, me and the other ministry, we said, what do we do? What do we do? What do we do? We said, okay, let's do $500. You get $500, we get $500. Okay? The we said, all right, good deal. We'll do $500 each. Because the pastor insisted, I want to bless both of your ministries. We went back to the pastor. We said, all right, pastor, since you insisted, listen, you don't have to do it, but would $500 be okay? You can do $500 per ministry, and that'll be fine. And the pastor looked at us, and he said, $500, huh? No. He says, we will pay you $1,500 per ministry. And we were like, really? He says, we value work. That's what he said. He said, we value work. We'll pay you $1,500 per ministry to go ahead and do this. Well, and then if you... It, there was another ministry that was working with us. If you remember, I told you there was a couple named Al and Magna Parks. Al Parks is deceased now. I mentioned it before, but maybe, yeah, the husband and wife couple. Um, so, you know, we... Uh, we, you know, I did diabetes one night, they did hypertension the other night. I did arthritis, then they did something else. So, you know, we just split it up. Um, so, ultimately, we do our presentations. At the end of the presentation, you say, how many of you would like a one-on-one -on -one consultation? And we would let them know, free, one-on-one -on -one consultation, where we can put together a lifestyle program just for you. And everybody would raise their hands. We want that. And we wanted them to want that. Because we knew... If you get into the home, you've increased your chances of getting that third angel to the heart. Amen. All right? We go into the home, and we consult. So now they filled this out, so now you know where you're going. You get all the cards back, and you know, okay, I'm going to go visit Mary. We're going to talk about diabetes. Okay, I'm going to go visit Bob, and we're going to talk about how he can stop smoking. We're going to go visit Joe, and we're going to talk about how he can overcome hypertension. You have it in front of you. There's no guessing work. They're filling out everything of what's wrong with them. Now... After doing that, we're going to go ahead and adopt the method of Jesus. You remember that when Jesus went to help people, when he helped the man at the pool of Bethesda, did he start spiritual first or physical first? He started with him physical first in John 5. He went and ministered to his physical need and healed him. Later on, he comes back to him and he says, now go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. So with him, he started physical first and then he healed and then he dealt with spiritual after. How about the man who was the paralytic? And his friends break up the roof and drop, drop him right in front of Jesus. Remember that story, right? Which one did Jesus deal with him first, spiritual or physical? Now, here goes two people with physical needs. But they were also two people with spiritual needs. But we see through the example of Jesus that with one person, he ministers to their physical need first, but then he brings in the spiritual after. With the other person, the first thing he says to them is, your sins are forgiven you. And then after that, he goes ahead and then he works with him on the physical thereafter. So you can, in your consultation, start with physical or you can start with spiritual. Let the Spirit of God lead you. You get that? So I'm not going to put before you only one way to do it. There's some people you're going to come in and you're going to start with godly trust first. You're going to start with trust in divine power first. Or trust in God first. Then with others... You're going to start with, let's deal with diet. Let's start with the diet. Let's start with this. So the key is get all of the laws of health within that consultation. And this is why your laws of health program can become a good guide for you. Because it shows you each. Godly trust. And then it gives you suggestions. Make a decision to fully surrender your heart to God. Confess and forsake all known sin. Develop a relationship, friendship with the Lord by spending time with him in the morning and in the evening devotional daily. And when you do that, you recommend your books. You're going to recommend to them books that will help them in devotion. Ministry of Healing, Steps to Christ, along with their Bibles. So you can recommend a devotional plan, kind of like what we talked about the other night. Remember that? And then you go through open air, daily exercise, sunshine, proper rest. You go through all of these laws of health as you're consulting with them and you bring out all those great points that you all brought out yesterday. You get that? Mm -hmm. This is what you're doing in your consultation. So remember that with Jesus. Remember that Jesus, and it was interesting because in Jesus' consultation method, you remember that Jesus one time, he saw a man whose son was possessed with a devil. And when his son was possessed with a devil, you remember Jesus' consultation method? 
One of the things that Jesus asked this individual when he saw the son possessed with the devil, he saw his condition. You remember that the Bible says, and he asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? So there's nothing wrong with saying, when were you diagnosed with diabetes? When were you diagnosed with high blood pressure? When were you diagnosed with whatever problem you have? The reason why is because you're trying to ascertain the cause. Very good. You're trying to ascertain that cause. Let me help you with something. Wonderful tool. If you have a smartphone, an iPad, or an Android unit, Blackberry unit, whatever, one of the things I'm going to highly recommend, <coughs> let me see if I have it here. Yes. One of the things I'm going to highly recommend, one that I use on mine, is this right here called WebMD. If you don't have this, I'm going to recommend you get this. You want to know why? Because when you have something like this, a tool like this, what this does is when you're sitting down with people, if they're on medication, because remember, you want to ascertain the cause. I met a man who was impotent. Impotent. He could not have an erection. This challenged his manhood, being a married man. Well, he said, Dwayne, he also had severe, case, severe issues with renal failure and diabetes. When he and I began to dialogue in our consultation, it really bothered him that he was in this impotent state. So I said, well, are you using medication right now? Yes, I am. I said, tell me about it. He told me the medications. I took out my WebMD. I started to look up. This can help you find any medication in existence. And it'll show you side effects. It'll show you its functions. I mean, it, it gives you so much information. In my opinion, to be an effective medical missionary, you need to have some kind of tool like this. Because people are on meds. And sometimes, remember what we studied in the Ministry of Healing 126? That sometimes the medication stays in the system, goes to other parts of the body, and creates problems at a later time. Remember that? So therefore, I study it. So when he gave me his medications, I said, all right. We typed in his medications, whoop, popped up. He was taking five, three out of the five side effect impotence. So therefore, I was like, I think we ascertained the cause here. One of the reasons why you're suffering with this, brother, is because of the meds you're taking. Did the doctor tell you why you want, he wanted you to take these meds? Well, he, he told me to take it because it's supposed to control my blood pressure. He took it so it can go ahead and control my blood sugar. So basically, the reason you're taking these medications is so that you can get your blood sugar or your blood pressure controlled, right? Yes. If there was another way that I can show you how your blood pressure and your uh, sugar can go ahead and be balanced without you having to take that, would you be open to learning how to do that? Oh, absolutely. All right. You put together a program for them. Now, here's what I do. I encourage people, talk with your doctor. Typically, when you have a disease, you have a physician. And I tell them, talk with your doctor. Let them know what you're doing. You're going to take yourself a health regimen. Why do I do that? Because, brothers and sisters, there can be some things about those medications that we may not know that the doctor does know. And I want them to share with their doctor what they're doing. So that way the doctor may say, no problem, but just understand that there may be an adverse reaction between your medication and this, and so on. I may not know that, but their doctor may. So therefore, there may be things that the doctor knows about the individual that I may not know. So therefore, I want to keep that in mind. Number two, I believe they can be a witness to their doctor. When someone is monitored by their doctor on a monthly basis and the doctor sees your blood pressure is getting better. Your sugar levels are being more balanced. And it looks like you're really overcoming in this situation here. What are you doing? That's what you want. You get that? So therefore, I am also encouraging that. If the person's doctor says, oh, that's quackery, leave that stuff alone, my recommendation always is the same. Fire them. Fire them. Fire that doctor as fast as you can. Go find another one. Any true doctor who loves their patients wants them off of drugs. <coughs> That's a fact. Any doctor. Even, the only reason the doctor is telling them to take the drug is because they don't know anything else for them to take. That's fine. 
but the, the doctor who cares about their patient, every doctor who's really studious knows that every drug has poison in it. Every drug has poison in it. So therefore, the goal is, I want to get you off of this. You need to take this because I know uh, in no other way to help you regulate your situation, but you need to get off of this. So therefore, I encourage them in the consultation, go ahead and talk with your doctor. If your doctor cares about you, they are going to be for you trying something that's going to help you get off the meds. If the doctor says no, then chances are they really don't care about you. You might want to consider finding somebody else. Yes, Sister Myers. Are they trying this while they're still continuing In many cases, we let them and the doctor decide. The question was asked by Sister Myers, do we tell them to stop taking their medications or what have you? I find that to be dangerous. I would not recommend that. Okay? I would let them know, talk with your doctor, and your doctor can let you know how much you can afford to scale back. And again, if a doctor cares about you, they're going to say, well, how long did this medical missionary say uh, the results should show up? Probably 30 to 60 days. Okay, you can pull back from the pills on 30 to 60 days, no problem. They're going to let you know that. Now, there have been many cases where that has taken place, where people will say, when I take the drugs, I feel like 50%. Since I've been taking the drugs along with this regimen, I feel like 80%. And then what they do is they start weaning themselves off. If they're taking five meds, they may say, okay, now I'm going to start doing four. And then they go from four, all right, now I'm going to start doing three. And then they start scaling back. So you can actually do this in a way where the individual can scale back all the way down to eventually none. So in your consultation, you're working with them. You're working with them. Your goal is to get them off of those situations, those drugs and different things. Did it help your to get off with them? Oh, absolutely. He's off of drugs. Praise the Lord. Oh, yes. Completely off. It's wonderful. And that's the key. So the one-on-one -on -one consultation, you're ministering to them. You're talking with them. You're laughing with them. You're doing what you walk in that house and you see that something's not straightened up and they are obviously in a position where they can't. You say, hey, you know, would you like for me to help you out with that? That would be very kind. Oh, no problem. You sit right there. And you go ahead and you help them out and you clean up. It's an opportunity to minister like Jesus did. Amen. To go into the homes, to go one-on-one. -on -one and to work with the people. I wanted to read a quote. Oh, my bride, she has it. Okay, let's see if we can find this. There is a statement that Ellen White says, and I believe it's in Evangelism 2.22. I'm going to look for it very quickly because this is something that you really want to understand. I promised my brother Hassan that I wanted to share this with him. I'm so glad the Lord brought this to my mind. Okay, let's see. Maybe 2.21, maybe. No, that's not it either. Okay. It's right in my phone. Easy part. Easy part. Let me, let me look up these words. It is a statement where Ellen White talks about the easy part of ministry. Let's see if we can pull it up here. I, just, I really want to get you, give this to you. Is Jared back there? Jared, ask mommy for my phone, please. So... Because I, I, I just feel like this quote is so important to you all because sometimes we think that ministry is what is done from up front. Many people think that ministry is what we do from up front. So the more up front we are with people in the preaching and the teaching and the proclamation of truth, that that is it. Evangelism? Okay, let me take a look. Let's all who engage in the personal ministry. Point four. Point four. Four thirty-eight. Four thirty-eight. It goes over to four thirty-eight. Okay. I don't know. This is what you're looking for. Paragraph four, right? Yes. No, that's not it. It's all right. It's coming. I'll, I'll get it out of my phone. Yes, my sister. Very good. This is why now, Sister Althea brings up a point. What if you go to a place and you uh, find that you have several consultation requests? 
you know, what do you do with that? So that now we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. Now let me, let me just pull this out for you very, very quickly. Yeah, here we go. Praise the Lord. Now that's interesting. It, it does say evangelism 437. <laughs> okay, let's see. This is from evangelism 437, paragraph 4. It says, a minister may enjoy sermonizing, for it is the pleasant part of the work and is comparatively easy. But no minister should be measured by his ability as a speaker. Too often we call people men and women of God because they can speak well. Um, don't do that. Try not to do that, please, because you will find that Satan can inspire people to speak very well. I, I, it, 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 I understand it's human nature, but it very, it's challenging to me when people will say, Brother Lemon, I know you're a man of God. And the only reason they're saying that is because they heard a sermon. And I'm just like, you have no idea what kind of person I am from a sermon. There are many people who can preach to others and they themselves be castaways. And this is why once we understand, don't, don't compliment ministers. Ellen White says in volume one of the testimonies to the church, I uh, believe it's 478, she says, never, never compliment a minister to his face. Well, if you said the Spirit of God blessed me when you spoke, is that a compliment? Or? Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you, you can say that, but, you know, praise the Lord for the message. You know, I've, I've learned, praise God for the message. Praise the Lord for the message. That message was for me. Praise God. And you just leave it there. Because we already, as God's servants, we already have the devil whispering in our ear, always trying to tell us we're greater than everybody else. We already have the devil trying to flatter our minds and make us think more of ourselves than we should. So we don't need those compliments. We don't want people constantly, you know, because of you, because of you. No, because of Jesus. Amen. You know, I never thanked a mailman before for the check that I got. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, I never thanked the messenger and gave him praise simply because he delivered a message that came from a source. I'm usually happy with the source and so on. So, you know, we're mailmen. In fact, just can I tell you this? Do you know Jesus knows our hearts are so wicked that he actually told us what to say when we do a good deed? You know what he told us to say, right? Go to Luke 17. Luke 17. Let me show you what he told us to say. In Luke 17, our hearts are so wicked that Jesus had to tell us what to say when we do a good work. Luke 17. Whenever we do whatever God commanded us to do, here's what we're supposed to say. And we are supposed to receive the thought, not the exact words. God is not saying to say the exact words, but he's showing us the principle in this verse. Luke 17. And look at this in uh, verse 7. Luke 17 and verse 7. The Bible says, but which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by when he has come from the field, go and sit down to meat, and will not rather say unto him, make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Doth he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? What's the answer in verse 9? I trow not. No. Now, look at verse 10. Jesus says, so likewise ye when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you say we are unprofitable servants we have done that which was our duty to do don't forget that when you do something on behalf of Christ just remember you're an unprofitable servant I'm an unprofitable servant I was only doing that, which it was my duty to do. Amen. To God be the glory. Really, to God be the glory. Amen. So therefore, our goal is we don't want to bring any credit to ourselves. We want God to get the glory. This is in the consultation. In the consultation, we're consistently directing the mind back to Christ. Eventually, after you give them your laws of health, like you did yesterday, you know what you did yesterday, that's what you're going to be doing in consultations. That's what you're going to be doing. Say again. Do we ask him like specific questions? Wait a minute. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, great news. There's a consultation form that I'm going to give you. The consultation form, it does everything. Literally, if you get your consultation form, 
All you have to do, again, you put your name, you could tweak it however you want. You just take your document, and once the person fills out the card, you just simply get the email, like, like this, right? So here it is. You get that email, and they, they fill all this out. You get their contact information. You then email them, and you send them your consultation form. It's a literal question and answer form through each of the laws of health. How much sunlight do you get? Do you eat between meals? What do you normally have for breakfast? Give me examples of the food items you eat. How often do you get rest? What time do you go to bed? Do you use a nightlight? Do you have devotion? What do you read when you have devotion? Do you go to church? Do you spend a lot of time watching TV? Do your children play video games? Such and such. It's, it literally is a laundry list of questions. Yeah. So then what happens is when you send it to them, they fill that out. Then they either email it or fax it back to you. You are fully prepared to go into your consultation and say, well, it looks right here like you don't get enough sunlight, and now here it is, you're telling me that you're suffering with lack of blood flow. Well, here's one of the reasons why. So what we're going to do in this is we're going to go ahead and increase your sunlight intake by making sure that you get a minimum of 45 minutes per day, Mary. Okay, now, you said you didn't get enough rest. Well, Mary, what we're going to do, and you just walk it through. Walk it through. Aren't they carrying it again because they got all of that when you presented it? Let me tell you something. How many times, honestly, yeah. How many times do we have to hear something before we get it? And then after we get it, how many more times do we have to hear it before we practice it? And then after we practice it, how many more times do we have to hear it before we share it? You get what I'm saying? So repetition does deepen the impression. But in other words, the consultation is beautiful step by step. Do you know all this time I thought that that consultation sheet was in here? I'm so glad that one of you brought that up just now. Otherwise, I would have gone with my assumption. So you're working with your card. You're finding out what their problem is. You're sending out your consultation form that they can fill out. They fill it out, get it back to you so you can intelligently go into that consultation. You go ahead and whether you start with, with the physical first and then to the spiritual or the spiritual first and then to the physical, however the Lord leads, you sit down with them and with Jesus' joy, you minister to them. You're not thinking, oh, I got to get them baptized. Got to get them baptized in the church. Blank those thoughts from your mind. All you're thinking is, Lord... Use me to bless this soul today. That's it. That's it. The other things will come. They'll come naturally. It's amazing. God will show you appeal. God will literally show you make an appeal. And then right there, you're going to say, you know what, Mary? I feel impressed to ask you a question. Would you be willing today to accept Jesus in your heart and let him be Lord of your life? You know, Mary, your life can change as of tonight. And you literally get them. You go in the house, and they were on the road to hell. And you go in the house, and now they're on the road to heaven. Amen. So that's what you're doing. Finally, when you transition from physical to spiritual, who remembers what we did with the exercise with Numbers chapter 12? Does anybody remember? Sure you do. We were looking at Numbers chapter What does Numbers chapter 12 teach us? The story of who? Miriam and Aaron. What do, we find, what do we find out about Miriam and Aaron? Miriam got leprosy. Why did Miriam get leprosy? What, what was the bottom line of why she got a physical disease? Sin. Remember that verse 11? Numbers 12 verse 11? We have sinned. Sin brings on disease. That's biblical. So therefore, what you do is you let that person know in the consultation. Mary, we now see that sin brings on disease. What's our next question to Mary? Mm -mm, not yet. Remember we talked about our next question. Once we identify that sin brings on disease, what's the next thing that we ask? No. Y'all were not listening. Y'all were sleeping on me. You were sleeping on me. Mary, do you see, Mary, that sin brings on disease? Mary says, yes, I see that. Mary, I have a very important question for you. What is sin? No, she doesn't know that. But that's why I want to lead her. Because remember, a consultation is not a consultation if you just simply give them right arm. You want to give them the body. What's the body called? The three angels. The third angel. You want to bring that gospel in there. So therefore, I got to go from physical. All right, I'm glad about the water. 
I'm glad about the sunlight, but I'm going to be honest with you. For the most part, new agers can teach people the importance of sunlight, water, rest, and the list. New agers can do that, but they're not going to give them Jesus. That's where you're different. So what we're going to do is we want to give them Jesus. So Mary, we just found out sin is a cause for disease. Do you see that, Mary? Yes, I do. Mary, what do you understand sin to be? Because maybe there's sin in your life that might be a reason why this disease is here. Mary, what is sin? I guess disobeying God. Mary, you don't have to guess. You can know. You walk her through the Bible. You show her what sin is, and then you don't know if you're promised to see Mary anymore. So you don't want to leave that house without giving Mary an opportunity to get present truth in her home. In the book called Port of Ministry, Ellen White says the book Desire of Ages is present truth. The book Patriarchs and Prophets is present truth. The book Great Controversy is present truth. You want to leave present truth. Present truth is truth for this time. The third angel's message is truth for this time. The third angel's message comes to the individual through the literature. Amen. You leave that with Mary. You leave that with Joe. You don't leave that house without making sure you leave that truth. And you're going to find out this week the key reason why is because we have already been told that the great loud cry of Revelation 18 will be largely accomplished through our publications. There's a science behind this, ladies and gentlemen. There's a science behind this. You get into that home so you can get present truth in that home because there's going to be a lot of people that's not going to respond now, but when they have the books, there's a time that's coming. There was a time in New York where people did not get all of these hurricanes and all of these horrible things taking place. But ladies and gentlemen, over the past few years, have you been paying attention to what's happening in New York? There's been several tornadoes in Brooklyn. That's unheard of. Tornadoes in Brooklyn, and now we're praying to God for my wife's mother and for my brothers who are up there in New Jersey with this horrible storm that's taking place. That we already know that prophecy already told us that these things are going to become more frequent and rapid. Ladies and gentlemen, we're watching prophecy unfold right before our very eyes. You got to start pleading with God. You got to start crying out to the Lord and say, Lord, please show me how I can be an instrument to help people get ready. And God says, the literature. It's one of the key ways that I'm going to get them. The literature. You don't want to leave a house without leaving literature. If you leave, you might die. You might get sick. Anything could happen to us. But that book remains in their house. So we take those books with us and leave it. That's, that's what you're doing. Absolutely. Whether you sell it or give it, that's up to you. But you bring them there, and by the grace of God, you leave without them. That's what you're doing in that consultation. Once that book goes into the hand, ladies and gentlemen, mission accomplished. That's what God wanted. Bring the truth into the home. One visit. One visit. You, Mary, this book, Patriarchs and Prophets, is going to show you the great controversy between God and Satan over those in the patriarchal age. Mary, this book, Prophets and Kings, showed us how God began to work through the prophets and the kings to try to bring people back to his truth. Mary, this book, Desire of Ages, the Library of Congress said that this is the best book ever written on the life of Jesus Christ. Mary, after reading this book, you're going to understand Jesus like you never have before. Mary, this book, Acts of the Apostles, this book tells us about when God started the Christian church and all of his plans of what he wanted the Christian church to be so that they can fill the world with the wonders of God and his goodness and the precious gospel message. Mary, this book, The Great Controversy, Mary, when you read this, be careful. You're going to think you're reading yesterday's newspaper. This book is going to show you all the things prophetically that Daniel and John the Revelator told us was getting ready to happen in this world. And Mary, it's happening right now. Most importantly, Mary, this book shows us who's going to win and how you can be on the winning team. You show Mary that and you let Mary see that thing. And you're looking at her in the eyes and you're praying, Father, anoint my mind, my words, that everything I say will penetrate every barrier that can come in between me and this soul right now. Banish Satan from this place that by the grace of God, this person can receive the gospel.
And you're pleading with God and pleading with that soul, accept this truth. And they accept that truth and they go ahead and get it. That's how they leave. They, they have present truth in the home. You know, it's a wonderful system. It's a wonderful plan. It's part of our pioneer work. It's led by the spirit of God and it's baptized with success. I mean, God has just really given us something awesome. I'm fired up. Ready to finish the work. It's 845, a little bit after. We praise God for this class. Um, you can. What we're going to do is we're going to close with prayer. As we close with prayer, I'm going to uh, make you aware of some things and then, we, and then we can leave, okay? So let's have a word of prayer and let's close. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, for the blessings of the things that we have learned. We thank you for your truth as it is in Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will help us to embrace these wonderful teachings that you have given to us and that you will show us how to be efficient workers to finish your work in this generation. May you abide with us and keep us, we pray, and thank you so much for these wonderful classes. I pray that your people have been edified, for we ask all these things in Jesus' name. <coughs> Amen. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to stay to entertain questions, but for those who are pressing who have to leave, I wanted to at least let you leave.